From Saigon, this is the American Forces Vietnam Network. Let's have some fun. Good morning, Vietnam. Welcome to the Don Buster. Beneath this snowy metal golden thing, the unborn grass lies waiting for his coat to turn to green. The snowbird sings the song he always sings. Tonight, a personal report by the Daily Mirror's special correspondent, John Pilger. Vietnam, 1970, the front line. I haven't been to Vietnam for three years. The war, after all, is a bore, so why go back? What is there left to say? Surely we've seen it all on telly. But our boredom has not made the war go away, so I've come back for the final act. No blood, no atrocities. Just the rejection of the war by those sent here to fight it. Just the quiet mutiny of the greatest army in history. This is Snuffy, some eight miles from the Cambodian border in a wilderness of jungle and mud controlled by the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. Snuffy is a beleaguered fort defended by the 1st Air Cavalry Division. The scene there looks so familiar, like a faded snapshot of another war we wish to forget half a century ago with its trenches and mud and barbed wire and boredom and young men and their puppies. Snuffy is important because it's the end of the line for the grunts. They are the 18-year-old drafted kids, the national servicemen on whom the entire army depends. They are the ones to whom the buck has finally passed from the president and the pentagon and the career men who catch coals in their air-conditioned command posts. Out of 400,000 American soldiers in Vietnam, only 80,000 fight, and almost all of them are grunts. Grunts in 1970 are a very different kind of American foot soldier. They are mostly from a world unknown to their commanders. They are the graduates of an American rebellion that stemmed from the war they have been sent here to fight. And quietly but massively, they have brought that rebellion with them here to Vietnam. For the grunts are unraveling the very fabric of the military. They are growing their hair, wearing love beads, smoking pot, flourishing the V sign of peace. And some are refusing to fight. The young men you see in this film are not a selected griping minority. I've spoken to hundreds of young soldiers and the rebellion they feel so deeply is everywhere. Stop, uh, spread of communism. I don't want to see communism spread all over the world. But nothing I can do about it. Just stay and do my time, which I'm going to do. Get, get out of Vietnam, go back to the world. I couldn't see any purpose in the war back home. Mm. I, you know, it never explained to me why we're actually here. And I, you know, I really had nothing against these people. I want to kill them. And you go out in the woods and they'll shoot at you first. You'll see them, you know, they'll shoot you if they get the chance. You have to shoot at them first. It's really bad. I still don't know why I'm here. That's the guy's truth. Three months and I don't know why I'm shooting these people. Today is the day. The grunts are the wheels of the green machine, the name they give the military. The green machine is comic book America with flesh on it. Today is the day for you to let people... A wonderland of heroes and slogans. In the green machine, a grunt doesn't seek out the enemy. He goes hunting for gooks. The green machine plays games like Wandering Soul. Wandering Soul is a tape that has been put out by the Psychological Operations Battalion and Benoit. It's used by the operating divisions and separate brigades. Broadcast a rally appeal to the Viet Cong. The tape itself is a rather weird one with the, the funeral dirge music in the background and a father talking to his children saying he's died on the battlefield and he's trying to encourage his comrades to rally and join the uh, just cause. The Vietnamese people worship the souls of their ancestors, but this wandering soul is very different. It was conceived in an echo chamber by the US Army and is broadcast from a helicopter over jungle where the gooks are supposed to be hiding. Oh, 
tôi vợ tôi vợ tôi vợ tôi tôi bà đang về với con đi tôi đã về với mình đây nhưng tôi còn có hôn lắm nên hai nữa tôi đã chết rồi má con bây ơi tất cả hắn thương tám thương biết chuyện nào We drop, I'd say, about 800,000 leaflets a day. We tell them what's happened to them in their battles. We killed three of your people yesterday, and they know it. We tell them also that you're going to be killed this, you know, into the future. You could be killed, and why? Why? We ask them to desert their unit and what will happen to them once they rally, how they'll be well treated. Well, actually, it's been pretty slow. So far this month, we've had five. Last month, we only had one. The object of dispersing our leaflets by helicopters they'll take a bunch by hand and throw them out most of the time occasionally uh, trying to get a direct result of a science mission they'll take a whole carton which you'll see and just drop it right out hoping to hit someone Let's have some fun. you've got pride and you're really proud of what you're doing and, and proud of seeing what you have done in the past And this division has lived on a proud heritage. MacArthur said it well. This division is first in almost everything. General George Custerdale was in the uh, cavalry. And uh, now instead of rattling sabers, we have rippling rotor blades. Lifers and grunts. The career men who command the rear, the kids who hold the front. A lifer is a person that wants to make a career out of the Army. That they sit back in air-conditioned rooms and say, OK, you, you, you guys go out there and fight the war. We'll tell you where to go and how to do it. But all they do is sit back there and draw their combat pay for not doing nothing. We just sit back there on their butts. A lifer is someone, that, to me, that stays in the Army 20 or 30 years. And... just out in the boonies, humping the big pack and all, uh, fighting, Viet, fighting the Viet Cong and the NVA. Who does the fighting, the grunts or the lifers? The grunts. There are some lifers out there with us, but uh, they don't see too much action on them. Very few. <laughs> lifers are always, always in the rear trying to run everything out in the field, and the grunts yeah. out there trying to do the best you can. Like, the lifers is a... Uh, say like they're back here and like they say go to this hill and this hill they don't look at the terrain and everything and how rough it is and everything and the grunt and the grunt's the one that has to go through all the all the hell grunt has to do the fighting yes out on patrol 28 days out in the boonies the green machine jargon for the bush where the indians are days of boredom seconds of terror a mile a day waiting to be shot at waiting to step on a mine Boring waiting. On this patrol we hear a chicken and the captain says it may be a Viet Cong chicken. No lifer in his helicopter can kill that chicken. Only the grunts can kill that chicken and its owner. On this patrol, the medic says to me, hey man, why doesn't TV show how boring this war is? I'm Army Sergeant Roger Clay Ashworth. Have a good day now. The difference between a lifer and a grunt is the lifer is supposed to know the why of it, and the grunt thinks there is no why of it. He's just over here, and it's, uh, we all count it in days. We can almost every one of us tell how many days we have left to do in Vietnam. When you're out on long-range patrol with this new kind of grunt, do you give orders or do you sort of enter into discussions? It's a combination of both. Uh, it's not near as many orders as I thought it would be. The, uh, there's a, an old saying in the United States Army that you, ha you, you don't tell American soldier, you tell him why. And I didn't believe it as much until I came to Vietnam. And I've had several times when uh, I thought my people were being insubordinate because they wanted to know why or my NCOs out there being insubordinate because they wanted to know why. And maybe because of the emotions at the time, you know. I had to say, 
you'll do it, damn it, you know, because I say you'll do it. If I had to do over again, I would go to jail. For one thing, in California, the max usually that you're going to get is three years. Okay, what's three years in the jail compared to two years in NAM or three years in the Army? I don't really think that uh, there is going to be another generation of American soldier. I think that people are just tired of it. There's, you know, there will be people in the Army, but uh, the people that really feel strong about it aren't going to go in. Already, Miss America, from Birmingham, Michigan, and Alabama. Out of the sky drops Miss America and her friends, just for the grunts. Flown in with the ice cream, packaged, homogenized, untouchable white flesh. Fodder for dreams of home. <laughs> are dying. At a level acceptable to both the American military and the American public. Another 65 this week, about the same next week, and the next, and the next, until the very last American division, combat division, is withdrawn. And so far, for all the words from Washington, only paper soldiers have gone home. The war isn't over, but it is ending. It is ending not because of the Paris talks or the demonstrations at home. It is ending because the largest and wealthiest and most powerful organization on earth, the American army, is being challenged from within, from the very cellars of its pyramid, from the most forgotten, the most brutalized, and certainly the bravest of its members. The war is ending because the grunt is taking no more bullshit. I just don't like, uh, I just can't take too much pressure from the army. You know. What happens to an unpopular officer out in the field? Mostly unpopular officers, from what I heard, if they, if they mess with a grunt too much, they get shot out there. A friend of mine, uh, Captain, uh, kind of got shot in the back. What, what was he doing? What was the Captain doing to deserve well, being shot what, in the back? Uh, from what my friend said, he was uh, telling them to just go on through. And, uh, well, they were, getting, they were getting hit pretty bad. And uh, he was telling them just to keep on going. <laughs> they said, no. He kind of got shot. Well, yeah, there's... 
lot of mistakes. But, you know, the grunts um, don't always do what the captain says, you know. We got, uh, see, the captain will stay back. He'll tell a platoon or something to go out so many hundred meters, you know. We don't do it. <laughs> we only go as far as we get out of sight, sit down, and come back in. We don't want to hit contact. That's one thing we don't want to hit. Vice President of the United States, Mr. Spiro T. Agnew, arrives in Vietnam. He visits the presidential palace in Saigon. Here he gives the President of South Vietnam a gift-wrapped filing cabinet, a token of his esteem. Are you in need of a friend? I need a friend. Someone who tells you things, important things. But I'd like to get to know you. Someone who offers you a wide degree of interest. Sports, good books, interesting stories, girls. Well, the Stars and Stripes could be considered a friend. After lunch, he will fly by helicopter to the heavily fortified American Embassy. There he will meet the American ambassador and American generals and pass out ballpoint pens and posthumous medals. Tomorrow he leaves Vietnam, having been assured that all is well. He will meet no grunt. A few months ago, when I was in the United States, this letter was given to me by a woman who lives in a small town in Ohio. The letter was written by her son, Kenneth, while he was serving in the infantry in Vietnam. I'd like to read it. Hello, Mom. Well, the shit has really started here. I've been in combat two months now, almost since the day I got here. I'm so confused about it, all I think some days is I'm going crazy. These people, the gooks, hate me, hate us all. So why am I almost dying for them? All the guys who are putting themselves on the line are grunts like me. We don't think this war is worth dying for. We don't think the lifers who won't fight are worth dying for. We've talked this out and we've decided to tell the company commander we're not working and walking into that bush again. At least we'll go to jail where it's safe. The afternoon Kenneth wrote that letter, he was killed. The telegram his parents received said he had died a brave man while storming a Viet Cong bunker. The medals they received said much the same thing. And the box they received in which their son lay was marked this way up, unviewable. How many Americans have been killed and wounded in Vietnam? Uh, through the uh, 22nd of August, 43,418 U.S. killed. How many U.S. troops are presently in Vietnam? Uh, how many U.S. troops are presently in Vietnam? Of these, how many are in ground combat? That is, they are likely to go out on a long-range patrol. Uh, I, we don't break them out that way. We say that uh, approximately 60% of our forces in country are in either combat or combat support units. Would a figure of 80,000 be near? A figure of what? 80,000. I don't really know off the top of my head. I'd have to take that question. Do you have a proportion of this for drafted men in Vietnam? No, we have no proportions on what kinds of uh, uh, breakout of uh, draftees or, or enlistees. Uh, there possibly may be at the Department of Defense. We don't have it here in the country. How many American casualties have been caused by mistake in the field? Do you have a figure for that? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. How many American casualties have been caused by mistake or accident, either in the field or on the base? Uh, you're, you're asking me for how many casualties by mistake or accident? Yes. Uh, would you, I don't have the statistics here, I don't believe, but would you rephrase the question because I don't quite understand. Well, it. for example, uh, when a man is killed by a friendly rocket, that is a mistake. How many people have been killed by mistake rather than have been killed by the enemy? I see. You're excluding, uh, you're, you're now excluding any accidents like uh, aircraft accidents or automobile accidents or this thing. No, I'm, no, including all those. All accidents, all mistakes. Uh, I don't have those statistics. There's available. no breakdown. 
I'll, uh, I'll find out for you. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what the desertion rate is for servicemen from Vietnam or on leave from Vietnam or on R&R &R for Vietnam? That's I, I don't have that, uh, that figure with me. What you have just seen is the daily press briefing for correspondents in Saigon. There are 444 of us here this week, although very few bother to come to what is called the five o'clock follies. The reason they don't come is that they don't learn very much here. For five years, the follies have gone on with much the same theatrical staying power as a West End farce. Every day, the same evasions, the same euphemisms, the same jargon. For ordnance, read bombs. For interdiction, read blasting away at nothing in particular. The other week, the firebase ripcord had to be evacuated. It was, perhaps, one of the major defeats of recent months. It was referred to here as a redeployment of troops. I've heard it said that the object of the follies is to lull the press into laziness and boredom. Just give them the old body count and they'll print it. And it's interesting that no major American newspaper ran the story of the massacre at Pinkville until competition forced it to. And one TV network is still using the same battle film over and over again. Perhaps this is why the war is such a bore. My name is Colleen and I'm from Wisconsin. Anybody here from Wisconsin? No, is all you people? As part of GAP, the Grunt Appeasement Program, at least that's what the grunts might call it, the donut dollies arrive at Snuffy. Donut dollies are girls of the American Red Cross sent to the front line to play games with the grunts. Good, clean novelty games like Monopoly, Quizzes and Blind Man's Bluff. Okay, what we're going to do is ask you to toss some questions on trees, okay? Here comes the first question. Who cut the wilderness trail to Kentucky? Danny Boone, this side. However, the novelty could be wearing off. The other day a donut dolly was blown up by a grenade and another was stabbed to death by grunts. This one nobody's ever gotten, so it's going to be 20 points. What is the name given to the byproducts of the forest, such as turpentine and resin? Sundries. What? It's pretty obvious that nobody knows your job like you do, the guy who's doing it. Maybe you know a way it can be done better with the savings of time, money, or manpower. Don't sit on your good idea. Spell it out in writing and submit it to your services suggestion program. I suppose some of you watching this film will say it's peddling the anti-American line yet again. Or perhaps another kind of person could make another kind of film. But I've lived in America and I've been in the mud of America's war in Vietnam. And I do know that thousands of young American soldiers, like the grunts of Snuffy, are fighting an enemy that isn't called Gook. It's called the US Army, and that takes guts. Out on patrol, one of my friends was the medic, and when I was leaving, he said to me, hey man, tell them back in the world we're coming home, and we're never coming back. I don't like violence. I try to stay out of much violent, out of much violent as I can, because violence is something not to, it's not, violence is not, nothing to play with. You gotta live your life the way you wanna live it. If you want to live it in violence, you live it in violence. If you want to live it in peace, you live it in peace. And that's how I live my life, peace. There's a woman traveling with two men. They opened fire and that's where you had to shoot back, you know. I think it's bad to have to kill women and children, but over here it's necessary. Definitely against violence, but, you know, it's just two years span. I can go back home, back to the old ways. Yeah, I'm thinking about my girls. I got a telegram two weeks ago and she died. It was a really bad thing. We were planning on getting married and everything. I really ruined a lot of my plans, you know, now I just want to go home and start all over. My wife's going to have a baby next month. Uh, I'm really looking forward to going home now. That wraps it up this evening on Million Dollar Music from the Big VN. Saluting.
Audrey. Get out. Well, A, it's damn cold. You're just thinking that there's some people with a cartload of money probably just coming home after a damn good night out in London or wherever it is that they do live, and you'll think, hell, I've, I've eight hours in front of me here. By the time I've done this in steam and heat, these people that I'm talking about, they buy a soap, for instance, and they've no idea the work that's gone into that two to three yards of cloth to make that suit. There's no idea what's, what troubles has gone into it, that men have, and women have had to work in, in some cases, very dangerous conditions. Tonight, a report from England by John Pilger, the Daily Mirror's special correspondent. This is a film about working people and about one working man, Jack Walker. Jack Walker represents the silent core of this country, those millions of average Britons who feel they have no voice in 1971 and who have little power to control their way of life. People who belong to and believe in trade unions, people whom politicians and many of us in the press and television now readily blame for this country's economic problems. It is the Jack Walkers who pay the majority of this nation's taxes and yet take home a wage which barely accounts for a decent existence. Jack Walker is a very proud man. He doesn't wish to complain. He didn't ask us to come and film him. This film, then, is not the voice of Heath or Wilson or Feather. It is the unheard voice of people. They don't understand. They don't know what it's like at all for a person to stand in the rain or the frost or the snow coming down and you're getting wet through there, waiting at six in the morning for a bus to take you to do eight hours. They don't know. They've never done it. They don't know what it's like. Six thirty a.m. Jack Walker, aged thirty-six, arrives at the place he feels his heritage has allotted him for life. A textile dye house beside the Yorkshire Moors. Here in the confinement of steam and fumes and pipes, Jack will greet again the machines that control his day. Fifteen years in the dye house, twenty-five years to go, with remission if he's made redundant, and of course eighteen pence off if he's more than three minutes late. thing in the morning, if you're on the morning shift, the thing is, you come in and you get stuck into the job. You know, you, you've got all to sort of start from scratch, as you will. And you'll get maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half, where you don't do anything but work. You know, there's no sit down, no smoke, you know, that type of thing. three machines and you get attached to them like you know you, you're so used to it the big one of the three we call big bertha like you know just among the lads you know <laughs> so when the layman coming in you'll cough your head off and your eyes you can't see and then when you're dropping the machine off like to empty the machine you're at a temperature of, what, 120 centigrade. Well, it's, it's hot. You get the steam with it, but these fumes seem then a lot more fiercer. 7.30 a.m. Jack's wife, Audrey, has left for the pram factory where she tends a heat moulding machine for eight hours every day. Her job is on a production line. Her quota is 200 pram sides every day. Pram after pram after pram. Yeah. 
gentleman's or Livingston daisies. Mm. What have you got in here, Jack? Oh, about three rows of potatoes in there. Mm -hmm. You grow flowers too, though, don't oh, you? Oh, yes, I. I'm a bit of a dahlia man, like, you know. I, in fact, last year I won the best award in the show at Shipley Show with my dahlias. Mm. Now, you were, you were born around here, all down here. Oh, yes. And, and your father well, lived down here. Yes. Jack, you've spent all your life in the dye house, and it's very likely you'll spend the rest of your working life in a dye house. Now, you earn about 20 pounds a week take-home pay, is that right? Yeah, that's it. Now, what above all can you hope for now, today? Well, around here, nothing more. That's, that's as much as, for, our, for the ordinary hours, that's the, that's the top wage around here. All I can hope for is that my daughter, she's a lot better than we've been, but she can get a good education. I don't want her to go into the mills at all. Uh, I want her to keep out of there. And probably the only way to keep her out is if she turns up to be a glamour girl and a fellow with a jaguar comes along and she's gone into the middle class or something like that. I'd like her to be a lot better than we are. And you'd like her almost to marry out of the working class, marry into something else? Yeah, yeah. Yes. With nothing, when we got married, with nothing. We've built up, we've... we've not very long ago, with nothing. Now we've both got to get working again. We've got that, that extra money coming in with Audrey working. We're better off than a lot more people are, I admit. But it's still hard. It's still very hard. The only daylight in the factory that we see is through the frosted glass. One can be in there, whether it be June, September, January or February, and if you didn't know, you wouldn't know what month of the year it was. Because all you can see out of the roof window is the sky. You can't see anything else. Uh, and this is, you don't know what year it is. One dreams about things of what one would like to do, but now, looking ahead, I can't see nothing for me in the next 25 years, but the dying and finishing trade. I'd like a, a little gardening shop where I could talk to people, not only sell them the gear, but talk to people about it. Pay time, just over 20 pounds this week. 20 pounds for work conceived during the Industrial Revolution and which cannot be imagined by those who do not work in factories. Perhaps this is why so many of us have such a distorted image of the unions and their ordinary moderate members like Jack Walker. For if one has not done it, who can possibly comprehend a life of clocking on and clocking off, of real sweat and hideous monotony, and every Thursday a pay packet with just enough? And who can possibly feel the fear that all the Jack Walkers now feel in 1971? Now the redundancies are being posted like battlefield dead. Audrey, it's all right, mate. Hello. What's the band? Oh. Kind of a day have you had? Fair like, you know, no. Not to brag about, but fair. Mm -hmm. Any news out? No, no, not really. I just want to get on with that budget last after me, down at Cricket Club. Oh, OK, then. So, is it in ten? Yeah. Hey, up, sweetheart. Hey, up, sweetheart. Well, I've got nearly ten pounds this week. Oh, really, have you Yeah. Well, we've done very fair this week, then. I've... Yeah. I've twenty. Twenty in a fuel shell. So we're not so bad there. If rent, three seventy two. Insurance, fifty six milk. Beverly's dinners, bread, TV, electric, gas, eaters, papers, holiday club, cigs, food, gratin, Beverly spending money, bus fares. No what else is there this week? No, I can't think about it. Oh, that's twenty two eighty five, is that damn thing again? What a couple of quid spending money. Hell we're back to square one again. What you say, Beverly wants a dress, don't you? Well, she could do me one. And a pumps are nearly off her feet. How much is that gonna cost us? Well, I should say about three pounds, so. That leaves us with a quid. <sighs> we're getting nowhere here fast. This 
you've got used to, you know, you're sort of brought up with the noise when you walk into the factory. <clears throat> and the fumes, there are some fumes worse than others. Some that make you cough, some that get on your chest. For instance, and there's a chemical there that we use. If you've used it that day, and you light a cigarette up at night, even in your own home, miles away from the factory, you can taste this in your cigarette. You know, you can taste it in your food. And it's rather a bad chemical, is it? Jack Walker has never been on strike, but he spent 10 months out of work during the marathon lockout of Denby Dye Works near Shipley, where he'd worked since he was a boy. That was eight years ago, and he has another job now. But he's never forgotten how 250 men were told they would be sacked unless they renounced their union. Denby Dye Works here in front of us has very special memories for you. You, you worked here for 13 years, your father worked here, and your brother-in-law worked here. Yeah. And you took part in what was the longest strike in this country's history uh, over a, a dispute at Denby's. Yeah. And yet you're not a militant, are you? Oh, certainly not, no. Tell us, tell us about that strike and what it meant to you. Well, it was reported in the local press that it was a, a foreman that ran a machine. This, this actually was madam. You know, what it was that Denby's at that time did not want the trade union movement in the works. They came and said, that if you want to work here after today, it's a non-union shop on our conditions. And the very next day, each man of the 250 of us was sacked. We all got our cards and a letter to say that we were sacked. And I think that this can happen to any man in Great Britain that's a trade union member. And I think that it's diabolical that after our fathers, like my father served in the trade union movement, for all the years that he did, I think that it's diabolical that any management in this country can turn around and say, we don't want a trade union movement at all, and you're sacked. Do working people feel that a Denby situation could happen to them at any time, and this is the reason for their, their, their uh, resistance to the industrial relations bill? I definitely think so. I think that the industrial relations bill particularly, and particularly in our, in our trade, the dying and finishing trade, before it starts, it's obsolete. There's no two ways about that. It's obsolete. And we work in closed shops where we work in liaison with the management, the shop floor, the union executives and what have you, and we don't have the troubles. It was just a firm like Denby's that put an advert in the local paper, Die House Men Wanted. And men walked in. Well, I'm saying walked in. They fetched them in in covered wagons where a man didn't show his damn face to the public that he were coming into his work for less than we were getting, a lot less than we were getting at that time. We have our own club uh, in Shipley, the trades all in Shipley, and they're not allowed. If they couldn't get another drink of beer in the world, they couldn't get a drink in our club. This is paid, we pay for that club through our union fees and they're not allowed in. And I'll tell you something, I don't want to even be where they are. Do you have many of these black leg people living near you? Oh, yes, sir. these fellas lives down the road here. Fellas that lives up the road that's still in there now. Still working there now. And I'll say this, I've said it before and I'll say it again. It, I'll say it till I die. If I saw one that would have fire in my garden, I wouldn't pee on him. And that's gospel truth, is that? To me, the fear is that you've got a job. One's married, one's got a family. That all of a sudden you feel secure. And then you get a thing like Denby's, where they say, every one of you is sacked. Not for bad work, not for stealing or anything like that. All of a sudden you're sacked. And believe me, John, you're like, the bottom's dropped out of your life. From once where you were felt secure, you've no longer got security. You're just, you're just somebody that stood on a picket line that a lot of people said were lazy buggers. You know, you stood there 16 months. I have pride, and I think the most people in our firm have pride in the work, knowing the main essential point is this, that if, if Jack Walker or anybody else in that firm doesn't do their work right, 
and then we have our customers that we are beholden to, then we don't get the orders. And we're back to square one without a work, as you might say. I'm fine. fine. I'm order one. Yeah. I've worked since, <coughs> excuse me, since 1950, and you've never known from one week to another week whether you would be working next week or not. You know, the trade is so that one, one time you can get a big order in and you can work even like our firm, for instance, we work today. This big order may, may have got out today. We can go on Monday to a normal day's work and on, two, on the Monday morning, you can say, well, we've just enough for today. We'll all be playing and playing it doesn't mean playing a game of football, a game of cricket. It means you're, you're out of work, you're idle that day with nothing for it. You take a fellow about 50, 55. If he don't sort of say good morning to the gaffer type fella, is he going to be out of his job? And this is his worry that if, if in a man at 50, if he's out of a job, it's, no, it's just no damn chance. There's fellas there at 40, they go for a job. I'm sorry, mate, you're too old. We, don't, we want a young man. Well, I ask you, you can go fight for your country at 40. You can knock them all down with a bloody gun at 40. At 45, you're too old. At 50, you've bloody gone over the hill. Can I ask I, you? Actually, I think they're trying to create the fear of unemployment. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that's actually the whole thing, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's the fear of unemployment. <laughs> Bridlington by the North Sea, a place to escape to. Fifty weeks in the dye house for two weeks in Brid. Bridlington is Jack's one big luxury. Where do you usually <coughs> stay in some of these hotels along here? Oh, no, they're, they're too big for us. We, we stay at the back. We have an arrangement where we're on the bed and crew it business. Oh, what's that? It's where you pay for the bed uh, to the landlady and she does all the cooking for you. You buy the food, she cooks it for you. Therefore, you get the... The cost for a week, for three of you, uh, staying with her would be approximately £10. Uh, then you would have your food on top of that, of course. Yeah, that's, that's the sort of thing they did during the war, wasn't it? We feel that it's dear enough to save up for the type of holiday that we are having. Same as people say, uh, it's all right, these fellas on £20 a week, they're going to Mallorca. We don't well, know many How many times have you been to Mallorca? Well, how many times have I been <laughs> off the island? Put it that way, I've been off the island once to yeah. go to the Isle, Isle of Wight. Yeah. Taking where you work, <coughs> how many people there have been to Mallorca, have been abroad? In Take any, this year, for year. instance. I should say, count them on one hand. Particularly in the day house, you know. But who are all these people, then, we hear go to the Costa Brava and go to Mallorca? We hear the, the, the working class of Britain spends their holidays <laughs> down there. <laughs> now then, now then, you see here, a fella that's going to Mallorca for a fortnight, we'll say. They, to me, if you're going to go, there's no point in going for a week. Yeah. I'll give you an instance. Just take my particular case. If I were going to go to Mallorca, I see it in the television, the newspapers, only £40 Mallorca for 14 days. Right. <clears throat> that 40 is for me, then I've 40 for Audrey, then, if you cut it in half again, I've 20 for Beverly. Yeah. So that's 40, <clears throat> 80, 100. Can't now, before that's before we start with anything else. Where'd your father go for holiday, Jack? They would go on the similar holiday that I go on now. So your holiday habits in a generation really <coughs> haven't changed? No, no, no. I, I can tell you. If Audrey's money didn't come in, there'd be very little difference between my father's way of life and my way of life. Uh, only that the prices differed in them days and the wages differed to what they are today. But similarly, they're the same. You know, if you break it down financially, they are the same. That he went to the, the dining and finishing shop, like I go to the dining, dining and finishing shop. He went to the club, I go to the club. We try to save in the building society. I haven't got a lot in other people's eyes, but I think it is. But I'll show you what, just what I've got. And this has took us, since we joined the building society, it's took us like three years to, uh, to save this up. Yeah. With it's and misses, like, you know. Yeah. What, uh, what have you got saved up then altogether now? I am totally valued at 100 pounds. 
That's yeah. my that's my that's, total. That's your assets. And that started in 1968. Mm. Uh, and we've been trying and trying to get forward. Three years to, to, to get a hundred... Yeah. You don't reckon on saving. This is only money that you have over by accident. Oh, yes, I. Yeah. As I say, I'd like to save every week, you know, but it don't always work out. Do you ever think that that hundred pounds has taken you three years to save... Oh, hell I. <laughs> ...is small change to some people? Oh, well... Can you imagine that? I can, that, I. Well, in fact, some people... Now that's sweat money to you, isn't it? It is. That I've, put some, I've put some good hours in for that, and my wife has. Yeah. We've put 82 and a half hours every week in for that. What are you saving for, Jack? Is it a house? Well, originally it was, yes. Uh, but the trouble that we've found, it's taken us three years to save this hundred pound. Uh, but if we'd have tried to save for the house, which has taken us three years now, we might have been six or seven years before we got a, a, a deposit to go down on this house. So now we've decided that we'd like to save this for Beverly, for when she gets to be either married or, or 21, so that she's got a better start than what, than what me and her mother had. I'm hoping that we can save somewhere like £500 for her. Did you have a, ever have anything like that? This is the most parents? I've ever had in my life. Does it, do you ever think that when Beverly's 21 and you give her the £500, that it may, with inflation, be not worth as much oh, as it is now. It, I don't think it will, like. I don't think it will. In, in 12 years' time. But to us, £500 is still £500. <laughs> How does fatigue affect you, Jack, after a day's work? I mean, what particular effect does it have on you? Well, as you, you may be going out at night, you probably get a bath and a shave, you feel champion. You probably go down to the club half an hour. I wish I had to come out, like, you know. But that's not probably every day. You're getting good days and your bad days. But same as night shift, for instance. When I work on nights, sometimes I feel like I could lift the roof off. Other time, five minutes after, I feel like I have done, you know. What to you is freedom? Do you feel you have a free life now? Well, I'll give you an example. Last year, I went to Southport Show. And it cost me, I should think, a fiver, all in. And I stood in a great marquee there with many hundreds of balloons and there was still, it was quiet, there was no noise, just the smell of the balloons and that to me was paradise. You know, if I wanted to go and get a drink, I got a drink, a sandwich, I had a sandwich, where I've never known that before, I've never been to a big show like that, to me it was paradise. Or snapdragons. And they're all set together. You're going to oh, yes, here. Transplant them. Yeah, it'll be a marvellous, marvellous colour here. You'll come about July and you'll see some colour then. Aye. What have you got in the greenhouse down here? I've just put uh, 18 tomato plants in and I hope to get something like, oh, 70 pounds of tomatoes mm. off. I hope, anyway. Gardening is more than a hobby to you, isn't it? What is it? It is. I feel that it's, to me, it's a way of life. Is that, for instance, when, when we got Beverly, we planted the seeds, you know, that way, whereas I plant my seeds here, I see that there's nothing I like better than to see the seed germinate, grow up, and in either whether it be a flower or a cabbage or a cauliflower, to maturity. And this is what I think about life. I think that one, the seeds are planted for us, and then one grows up, gets married, and starts the whole circle again. And I feel that we sort of originated from the land. We weren't used to all this mills, factories, all the noise and that. We were, we were never used to this going back over the generations. And I think that I, I like to come back to the land and I get some real pleasure. It's hard at times, but I get some real pleasure out of it. Two o'clock, the shift is over. Jack will now go home to his council house and bail them to his view of mills and black churches. And at dawn the next day, the alarm clock will ring again and he'll come back to the dye house, always remembering the rule, 18 pence off if he's more than three minutes late. But Jack Walker is almost never late. How are you, lads? Uh, I've left those to my plants for yeah. those lads in the time office. Yeah. We terminated the negotiations yesterday. Uh, satisfactory, we think. Yeah. Uh, 150. Uh, two... 
put two ten pence for uh, males, one fifty for females, two pence increase on the night allowance. Yeah. To become operative on the twenty fourth of May this year. Oh, okay. very good, lad. Very Please good. Jack. Right, I'll see you later, Okay. Get off. Jack Walker's union, the dyers, bleachers and textile workers, is a century old this year. The two pounds ten pence rise is the highest the union has ever won. And the way inflation is going, in two years, Jack's wages will be back to where they are now. But as Jack says, a pound is a pound, worthless or not. And anyway, what can he do about it? Oh yes, there's always Beverly. Maybe she will find that man with the Jaguar to take her to the middle class. Vietnam ended officially in January last year. American troops were seen to go home. Mr. Nixon said it was peace with honor at last. And those of us who had reported the war through its longest years also went home. For as a news story, the whole boring mess of Vietnam was finished. So much for the fantasy. Since the Paris Agreement and the so-called ceasefire, more than 70,000 soldiers and civilians have been killed in Vietnam. But this film is not about the day-to-day -day slaughter of soldiers. It's about the continuing and growing and forgotten suffering of the Vietnamese people in what is still, almost incredibly, America's war. On the streets, the Americans appear to have gone. They haven't. The Pentagon has thousands of men in Vietnam. They include senior officers, pilots and technicians, many of them disguised as civilians and embassy officials. American military headquarters is now called the Defense Attaché's office and functions almost exactly as it did before the Paris Peace Agreement. But the majority of Americans in Vietnam, without whom the war could not go on, are servicemen who have transferred directly to the payroll of some 60 American companies on contract to Washington. Some of them have been here eight and ten years, you know. Uh, their contract normally runs on, when they're working for a contractor, uh, usually run a year, but. Uh, most of the people have been here a number of years, three years or older. People who've transferred from the army and then gone on to contract work. Many uh, of them. Many of them in that category. What were you doing in the Air Force? I was working on an electronic countermeasure system. What, a, what is that in plain uh, language? In plain language, that means uh, um, a device that will let you know uh, that radar is being look, is looking at you, yeah. and it will let you know that that is happening. A surveillance device. Basically, device. a surveillance yeah. device. Yes, and that and that's the that the extension of that is the kind of work you do now. Yes. So what would happen if the, the Vietnamese didn't have the surveillance assistance, didn't have the American assistance now? I'd say within a week to possibly a month, um, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong would probably overrun this country very easily. Yeah, yeah. Who are the American pilots that fly the planes first and train them? Are these military people? No, civilians. Civilians <coughs> from uh, these aircraft uh, companies, companies like uh, Lockheed and uh, well, the, uh, Northrop. 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 Yeah, they, yeah. Build, they build the F-5. GE makes the engine for it. And um, they, they know the aircraft. So. They fly the aircraft until they can train the Vietnamese. Yeah. And they will uh, stay over here. I don't know how long, a six-month contract or whatever it may be. Will Plunkett, a nice guy from Atlanta, Georgia, has been the man from Monkey Mountain since he transferred from the Air Force to Kentron Hawaii Limited, a defense contractor. Monkey Mountain overlooks the city of Da Nang and is a vital power plant, radar and surveillance base, equipped by the U.S. Air Force and run by Will Plunkett. If I just come and go. Willis, the man from Monkey Mountain, this is your very private domain up here overlooking Da Nang. 
What are the installations here? What kind of work do you do? Well, I'm, um, right now I'm an uh, advisor to the VNAV power plant. Uh -huh. And um, they have the radar up here for um, air traffic control and different things. And they also keep an eye up north, you know. Yeah, in North but Vietnam. There has been uh, quite a few penetrations down here of the North Vietnamese aircraft. But a power plant controlling what? Controlling military installations in Da Nang itself? Right. So you're a very vital man. Do you think without you it, uh, it could be run effectively? Um, yeah, I think without me the card game wouldn't be any good, you know. I wish there was more appreciation shown on the Vietnamese part. We stand uh, quite a flow of... This, this was the starting point for the Chinese takeover of all Southeast Asia, which hasn't stopped and won't stop for years. But had it not been stopped here, this part of the country or this part of the world and these people would have been as isolated as China is today and has been for over 20 years. And it wouldn't stop there. There would be Taiwan and Japan and then anything else that they felt that they could just sort of, uh, like a plague, go over the top and isolate to become their people. And that's what would have happened. But we stood up to them. We stopped them. We put the fear of God in, more or less to speak. And... Uh, Hopefully this has stemmed the flow now. I think it was all worth it. Definitely. Definitely. Every, every, every limb that was lost and every individual sitting back in a veteran's hospital now and every death, it's, I think it's all worth it. I surely do. Last month, President Nixon asked the Congress for $2 billion in aid for Vietnam. Most of it will be military aid. Less than a half of 1% will help civilians maimed by the war. These people are lucky, for there are still only three hospitals for civilian amputees in Vietnam, and this one at Quang Nai, run by the Quakers, is the best. Nothing has changed here. They still make their own limbs and wheelchairs, and they still can't meet the demand. Most of our injuries, war-related injuries, are our mines, and second are grenades, third are artillery and gunshot. But primarily, our biggest problem is kids stepping on mines, and that is the same problem that existed in 1972. And I think it's very interesting to note that that's covered in the peace accords, and the peace agreement, is, I think it's Article 7 or Article 15, I'm not really sure, which says that 15 days, at, oh, there's where the 15 comes in, 15 days after the ceasefire, um, all mines will begin being cleared. We have seen nothing um, that, that has happened in that area at all. This is, of course, over a year after the ceasefire now. This kid was injured last September, and um, his father sells gasoline. And when the two sides were fighting, some stray bullets came into his house, and the gasoline was set off, and this kid was very, very badly burned. He not only has burns on his face, but also on his legs and his feet. You can see that his feet are pretty badly contracted. He probably has trouble walking. It's a very severe problem for kids like this. There just isn't the kind of plastic surgery around to take care of them. How old is he? Seven years old. He looks very much in shock still, is he? He's a pretty sad kid. Her name is Tan Wien. And what happened to her? She was out taking care of cows, and she, she stepped on a mine. It's the same old story, isn't it? Yes. And she's lost her right leg below the knee. She may be an AK. Let's look. Yeah, below the knee, that's so right. She, she probably stepped on one of those little foot bombs. Yeah. Em nhớ không là là mi này. Okay. The, the man behind us, she's not giving any answer, and the man behind us said, uh, the mine exploded. How is she supposed to know? She didn't see it. Of course, kids will go on stepping on grenades and mines for years to come, I imagine. Right, and uh, that's a, a new problem now. We see a lot of that happening now. Um, How old is Jin Tihai? She's 16. She was out cutting um, a rau, or vegetables. You know, so there's a green vegetable that grows that people eat here a lot. She was out cutting that to gather for family, and she stepped on a mine. These were the strictly anti-personnel, anti as they called them. Oh, yeah. Like Might that. flatten a front wheel on a bicycle, but the thing it's best at doing is taking off feet. Mm. Julie, how do civilian casualties now, in the second year of the peace, match up with casualties in the last year of the war? Well, year, in the year 1972, which was the last, quote-unquote, the last year of the war, 
uh, about 65% of our patients were war-related. That means directly war-related, a mine or a, a, a shot. 61% of our patients in 1973 were war-related. If you're in the midst of the war here, why do we still have a war now, in the second year of the so-called peace? I guess the biggest thing for me is that American aid continues here. And as long as the arms flow into Vietnam at the, at the, rate, they're, you know, at the rate they're flowing in, people are going to go on getting shot, mines are going to go on being laid, new mines are going to go on being laid, and people are going to go on being injured. As far as I'm concerned, there should be an end to, to all military input into this country. How many Americans are still here in South Vietnam, directly or indirectly involved in the war effort? Uh, the uh, last statistics that I saw released by the American uh, embassy, and I think that uh, is uh, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, accurate, is about uh, 6,500 uh, all counted. But Dr. Kissinger has said it's only 2,300. Client and master cannot agree. Unofficially and reliably, there are 15,000 Americans still in Vietnam. How many soldiers and civilians have been killed on both sides since the Paris Peace Agreement? Well, the, if you want the uh, total, I have to add a li little bit here. Uh, 52,000 plus uh, 14,600. That's uh, 66,600. And uh, plus another 2,500 uh, civilians. Uh, that's uh, 69,000. What happened to Yang? Three weeks ago now, uh, M. Yang uh, was on one of these defoliation operations in front of the troops. They hit a mine and blew up. Two were killed right on the spot. Seven were seri uh, seriously injured. Yang was one of one of those. What she's saying is that they're used as human mine detectors. <clears throat> they have to clear the minefields. That's really what it amounts to. Uh, it, uh, uh, this comes as something of a surprise to us, but now in finding out about her and inquiring around, we've found that there are a number in the hospital just like her who've also been forced to go out and around the perimeters of outposts clear away brush in areas that are heavily mined. I asked her, why did you go and help out with the operation? She said, uh, well, if we didn't go, the soldiers would beat us. Uh, and so everybody has to go. Uh, Earl Martin is another kind of American who has lived and worked with the Vietnamese. He took me to a refugee village called Son Tra. Here, almost everybody is starving, regardless of the thousands of tons of food which leave the United States and Saigon, but seldom get here. Vietnam has always been the rice bowl of Asia, and hunger is one ordeal they've never known. Sorry about all the kids tripping us up. He's just saying that the reason so many kids are following us is because they think we're going to give out some food. Uh, he keeps yelling to them that, no, indeed, we're not going to give out any food, but they keep following me anyway. Has the food situation improved here at all since the ceasefire? Well, the people have been here for since 66, and they've always been eating very little. But by and large, the, situation is, the food situation has gotten even worse since the ceasefire. Uh, People are a lot hungrier now than they were a year ago. Yeah. What is that, Earl? What, what is he eating? It's the foliage of uh, sweet potato plants. Uh, uh, I asked him if the ludicrous question if it's good. And he said, uh, of course not, it's not good. Uh, but so, we're hungry, we have to eat it. So this is the village food supply at the moment, isn't it? This is what the people eat. The Saigon army outpost is not defending the villagers from an enemy. It's preventing them from going back to the abundance of their rice paddies just three miles away in so-called enemy territory, although the villagers might have another view of who is the enemy. Even their fish harvest is in danger. Fish in the bay have been poisoned by chemical pesticides dropped by American planes. And further out to sea, the fish can't be reached because there isn't enough petrol for the small boats. Graham Greene wrote his novel, The Quiet American, here at the dear old Palace Hotel in Saigon. Green described a type of almost lethally innocent American official whose aim was to sell the American way of life to the Vietnamese, whether they wanted to buy it or not. 
Under Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy, the quiet American became real and multiplied, passing out millions of dollars and favors and portable flush lavatories and weapons and arranging the quiet extinction of those who opposed the regime they wished to set up. But somehow it all got out of hand and 53,000 Americans and 2 million Vietnamese were dead. Now the quiet Americans are back, doing almost exactly what they did 10 years ago, passing out millions of dollars and favors and arms to a client regime they wish to prop up. How ironic it is. It's all come full circle here. It's all back to where it was when it began. We definitely are vital at this stage. Uh, they're in a transition period trying to uh, make something of a growing country. And uh, we just will help them until we feel that they can handle the uh, situation themselves. And at, I'm sorry. And at that time, we intend on leaving. Yeah. My plans are to expo export, I believe. I'm, I, I want to export Vietnam products. And I think we can do it. Also, I would like to install in-country security systems, electronic types. Round and round the garden goes the teddy bear. One An American embassy official arrives at a Saigon orphanage to award the best child of the month prize. All the children here are bastards of the American war, for which the embassy will do nothing, except, of course, to provide that free ice cream for the lucky prize winner. What about this little one down here? Oh, she's been here only about uh, three weeks now, I think. Yeah. Um, she was found abandoned uh, on the streets of Saigon, and some yeah. taxi driver picked her up and took her to one of the Vietnamese hospitals. Yeah. Uh, and she's totally abandoned. We don't know who the mother and who the father. Well, so the father was an American, obviously. GI, yeah. and yes, obviously. Hmm. What's her name? Wow, H-O-A, wow. that means she's a lotus, lotus oh. flower. Victor, you've written a report on all these children. There's one on Kong here, which I think I'd just like to read because I think it sums up a lot about the children who are left after this war. Yeah. It says, now about the mother, it says she was a smack girl, that's a bar girl. Mother, right. and she met him, the father, in 1969, a GI. They fall in love each other. This is written by Vietnamese. They stay together illegally. She has a son. When she was pregnant, her husband left Vietnam. His friend pitied on her and helped her. Later, they stay together as husband and wife, and she delivered another child. Both of her two children are black. She did not know the name of the second husband. Now the mother earns money as a prostitute. She's in debt, but she said she dare not ask for more. The only one thing she hopes for is the health of her children. Her youngest child is two years old now father unknown. How long do you think Vietnam will produce orphans? Can you see in a few years' time that you won't be having orphans here? Oh, well, <laughs> there again, it's a very difficult question, I suppose. Um, hostility still continues and uh, orphans are being made uh, every day. So as long as this kind of uh, situation continues, I think the need for uh, child care assistance is going to continue in this country and uh, we are here only to go on helping as long as the help is needed. The Americans here are just the same as before, only the uniforms are different. And because the Paris Agreement says they shouldn't be here, an appropriate euphemism has been found for their work. The war that gave us ordnance instead of bombs, neutralizing instead of killing, has at last renamed the military, Management Services Division. These men are employed by the Lear Siegler Corporation and in effect run the Saigon Air Force. The Paris Peace Agreement was signed on January the 28th, 1973. Article 4 says, The United States will not continue its military involvement or intervene in any way in the internal affairs of South Vietnam. 
More than a year later, Americans are still here at the base at Da Nang, still playing their Saturday afternoon softball game. Perhaps someone forgot to tell them about the Paris Agreement. The guys of Management Services Division are all nice guys, who never see the victims of the bombs and napalm dropped by planes which wouldn't fly if the Americans were not here. Get a hit now. Booty getting tired. Booty getting tired. Go away. Run on anything. Get a hit. Booty getting tired. Go in there. Booty getting tired. There's a future for everybody here. There's no future here. The only future here is to make it while you can and get the hell out. Very few people are emotionally involved in the wars anymore. Well, you, you, uh, both you people advising uh, the Vietnamese Air Force, uh, now if you two left and people like you left, what chance would uh, they stand against? Uh, They'd fall on their hands. They could overrun this base, I'd say, in a week, wouldn't you? A good week. Uh, any any time here. they want, any place here, they'll take it. It's air to air. Every, what I talk to here is filled with gloom. They're either looking forward to leaving or they say that the, uh, the whole thing is going to collapse without the Americans. It's, it's not going to collapse. You take a look. All they'll do is change their government. You take a look right now in North Vietnam. Your little mama son is still out there on the street selling her tomatoes. The country cannot work any other way. Your idea, or the American idea of communists, as applied to Asia, just doesn't, just doesn't All right. apply. But you, you have preconceived concepts, and they're out there. They're going to their schools. They go to their schools the same way. They run their markets the same way. All the changes is the guy in power. But doesn't, doesn't this contradict the whole reason for an American presence here for the last seven, eight years? Do you think after all those years and all those deaths that it was worth it? No, I don't. Why don't you? I've seen the war here when I was here in 66 and 67. I've seen it here as a civilian. And I don't think it was worth it, no. Yeah, but you but haven't... But that, that's you, my opinion. But you haven't, opinion. you haven't lived with the Vietnamese. And I've lived with the Vietnamese. It's, it's my tax dollars going, no. too, though, see? Well. There's lots of problems all over. And there's too many Americans down on this country right here. Too many people, too many years, you know? It's, uh, there's lots of problems here. Could I, could I ask you, do you think it was worth it? Do you think that 52,000 deaths here was worth... 52,000 deaths. American were, deaths. Were 52,000 American deaths are less than we lose in traffic in one year. You don't but even did. miss it. But, but here you are in a it situation. It wasn't a great war, but it was yeah. the only war we had. Said it was on a morning when they were going out to cut grass and to harvest their rice like normal. And uh, at six o'clock in the morning, the, the cannons started blasting from the hill and then the troops came in, rounded up the people in, in this area, right, right down along this stretch uh, and shot them. Rồi người ta xuống vào vào kinh này. Dạ, họ bán xuống cây này. Rồi trên đây cũng có, dưới cây cũng có. There is bodies in the ditch, bodies along the banks. His father, his mother, a younger brother and a younger sister were all killed. 
My Lai was the worst massacre of the old war and is now a symbol of the new war. A few days after we filmed there, it was a battleground once again. And once again, the survivors were refugees and moved down the hill. When American officials, those officials who are still in Vietnam and still doing so much to run the war for Saigon, come to a place like this, how do they get the optimism that still tells them that there is a chance still for a successful American involvement in Vietnam? It seems to have gotten to the point where you've almost got to continue believing the story. You've almost got to continue believing the reasons for why you were here in the first place. Uh, uh, if after so much investment and uh, so many American lives lost, we discover it was not really to help the Vietnamese people at all, but the total effect of it has been to devastate the landscape of Vietnam and to, and to have a scene uh, like we just visited uh, by the ditch at My Lai. Uh, if you have to come face to face with that reality, it's almost too much. Uh, so it's almost that you've got to continue believing the myth that it was good that we were here. There is a waiting list for burials at this military cemetery near Saigon. And these are the new graves of young Vietnamese soldiers killed in one week while we were there. There are 70,000 graves in this cemetery. That's exactly the number of dead in 16 months of peace with honor. about thalidomide. I expect it will surprise almost all of you, perhaps even shock you, that the thalidomide affair is not over. Last year, after 11 years of struggle, the children won their compensation. But there are still 98 children whose mothers believe they took thalidomide and who've got nothing. Thalidomide, the wonder drug, was introduced in 1958 by distillers company Biochemicals, part of the giant whiskey and gin firm of distillers. Its advertising said how safe it was, in its varied forms, it would take away your headache, put you to sleep and calm you. Two and a half years later, the drug was withdrawn after reports of deformities in newborn babies. In Britain, the parents of some of these babies began claims for damages against distillers. And because the matter was then sub judice, it rested for ten years. In 1972, the silence was finally broken. The Sunday Times had begun its historic and untiring campaign to get compensation for children most of us had forgotten. As a direct result, public pressure built up, Parliament intervened, parents were called to many meetings, and eventually distillers settled. We now have the 20 million protected against inflation. Now let's get the small print right. But for some parents, the small print meant that the struggle was not yet over. Within the settlement, there are two lists of children, 342 on the X list who benefit, and 98 on the Y list who don't. To get compensation, a child must be moved from the Y to the X list. 
The X list were those mothers who could show proof that they had taken thalidomide in the first weeks of pregnancy, or they were children who were assessed as thalidomide damaged, mostly on the basis of examinations by just one child specialist. The Y list parents are those who, when they came to look for proof, found their doctor had died or retired, or the medical records destroyed or missing. In some cases, the doctor denied giving the drug, although the mother remembers taking it, or the mother got the tablets from a friend or directly from a chemist. Anyway, like most of us, most of them didn't know what they were taking. I asked him, did they put home visits down, you know, did they put everything down when they came to see you, if they gave you anything at home? And he said, well, they couldn't remember to put everything down. So, you know, it might have, could have just been missed off. They were distressed because the Thlidomide families had been awarded quite large sums of money. And yet, they had what they regarded as thalidomide children mm. who were receiving no money. Mm. They were bewildered because they didn't qu quite know what to do. Mm. They were an uncoordinated group of parents spread all over the country, mm. and I felt they didn't quite know where to turn to. Sandra Tootle was born without legs and with two crooked feet which have since been amputated. Her hips are deformed and her left hand has just three fingers. Her mother, Margaret, says that during her pregnancy, a doctor gave her two lots of tablets during two home visits, without prescription and in envelopes. I've been having a lot of trouble sleeping and worrying, you know, so he, he had Stan sent for him and he came and he gave me these tablets in an envelope and he'd had Distaval written on. Well, I'll, I'll always remember this because we had a little blue cupboard and I always kept these tablets up there. After I'd taken one, I'd put them back. And, uh, you know, I definitely remember that. And, uh, well, my meal husband does too because we'd kept, we'd, we'd kept saying we'd get rid of this little cupboard and it had a little ledge on. And, uh, we were going to take it down, but these tablets were on top. Mm. And I distinctly remember them, you know. I, I, I wouldn't forget them, actually. Do you think the tablets that you took then were the same as those you took in the beginning, in the first weeks? Well, I can't say they were because I can't remember. Mm. Do you think you've been rather too trusting in all these years? Well, I, I don't think we've pushed it off in anything, really, all the years, you know. we. With the legs and that, we don't push enough with them. I'm not a person that likes arguing and, you know, What's saying that? things to people. And I'm very timid, actually, of people. I don't, you know. Yeah. When we go to see specialists and that, people have told me I'm too quiet and I don't say enough and ask enough, you know. Keith Lewis is chairman of the Y Group Parents Committee formed last year after it became apparent that those children left over would have to fight on. He is the father of 11-year-old Mark, who was born with arm and shoulder deformities. I asked Mr Lewis why the wireless parents signed the settlement. You must appreciate that this thing had gone on for ages. Uh, everybody was uh, basically happy with the uh, amount of settlement. If all those children were on the wireless held out, it would only slow down proceedings for the people who were on the X list who could receive compensation. Alec Perkis, as an X list parent, do you think the Y list parents have been treated fairly? No, I think their situation is most unsatisfactory. They've been in doubt for many, many months, many years in some cases, and still they have no idea whether their child will benefit or not. I wondered myself, why were their signatures necessary? But Distiller's offer was conditional on a majority, an unstated majority, of claimants accepting the offer. So another 90-odd acceptances helped Distiller's to wrap it up. You go to see a doctor and when he tells you something, you, you gave, gives you something, you trust in what he's giving you. I mean, same with solicitors, if you take your problems to him and he's trying to do it for you. Just leave it with him in trust, don't you? I mean, you have to trust a person who's trying to do something for you. 
Because Sandra's deformity does not follow a certain pattern, and because there is apparently no mention of thalidomide on her mother's medical record, she is on the Y list, and if she stays on it, she will receive nothing. The two lists were drawn up by the London legal firm Kimber Bull, acting for all the families. The effect was to weed out those children who didn't have proof or who weren't typically thalidomide deformed. But by signing the settlement, all the parents, X and Y, gave up all legal claims against distillers. They agreed not to sue distillers, but the Y list had to prove thalidomide damage to win the right to the X list. After the High Court approved the settlement, Kimber Bull advised the Y list to find new lawyers, as there was now a conflict of interest. For if a Y-list family fought their way onto the X-list, then those already there would get less money. Would they have signed if they'd known they'd have to find new lawyers? Uh, I don't think people would have signed had they have known that the cut was going to be so quick and had they have known that we were going to be left in a position of virtually no support. She came in with a letter from the solicitors in London saying that uh, they felt that at this stage she ought to be separately legally represented because her child had now been or was on the Y list and that they were acting for the X list children. David um, Brooks is a Lancashire solicitor acting for another Y list family. He is just one of those solicitors throughout the country who has had to pick up the endless legal strands of the thalidomide tragedy after Kimber Bull had stopped acting for the Y list children. This child was born with this deformity and she's been doing her utmost for the child ever since to establish that it was caused by this drug. Um, she had had a lot of very detailed and complicated correspondence. Uh, I can't say whether she understood it or not. I imagine she found it very difficult to understand. Uh, it took me quite a long time to read it and understand it. Um, she just came in with a plea to see what I could possibly do to help her. Having caught the backwash of the thalidomide affair 12 years later, what is your view of two lists, X and Y? I view it with suspicion. I think it's appalling, personally. Um, from what I can gather, and I hasten to add, it's only my, from my own information, um, there seems to be very little difference between the evidence which got some children onto the X list and some children onto the Y list. <sighs> Perhaps I'm putting it a little highly, but it seems to me that somewhere, somewhere along the line, possibly unknown to that person at the time, Somebody has asked, been asked to almost play God. Very sparkly, natural, sparkling person. Yeah, she's she's a great kid. She's she really is marvelous. Very very bright, very alert. Sonia West is 11. Her mother suffered from nerves during her pregnancy and took a great many pills. Mike, when do you think your wife took thalidomide? It was back when she was pregnant with Margaret, and the illnesses she had between the pregnancies. She started getting in trouble with nerves. She was treated by the doctor at the time. She doesn't remember what these were? No, she wouldn't. Uh, Your wife takes a lot of pills. She's had a, 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 a history of nervous disorder when she was younger, just after we first got married, which happily has cleared up now. I asked Mike West, when did he first suspect that Sonia was a thalidomide child? Well, I think from the moment she was born, I assumed she was a thalidomide child. There'd been a lot of publicity with the drug being withdrawn a few months before she was born, or within a year anyway, and I just assumed she was. Mm. And everybody else seemed to assume she was as well. In a campaign to uncover outdated medicines last October, 200 thalidomide tablets turned up in Worcestershire. My GP, this was. What did he say to you? He said, it's, he did mention thalidomide, you see, right? And I wasn't quite sure about this at the time. You know, I wasn't sure about thalidomide anything. It's all new to me. And he said he wanted to know where I got the drug from because he can't remember prescribing it. Professor David Poswillow is a renowned specialist in birth deformities. For the past five years, he's devoted himself to finding out just how thalidomide works. Pregnancy lasts nine months and people forget what happened in the first few weeks of development. And so it's extraordinarily difficult to get an accurate history. And you really cannot put a jigsaw puzzle together if many of the pieces are missing. 
so much depends on the clinical history. If one can establish that there has been thalidomide intake by the mother during the sensitive period, then I think it's impossible to decide whether a malformation was definitely caused by thalidomide or not. And in the presence of a powerful teratogen like that, I think the onus of proof is to prove that thalidomide didn't cause it. <laughs> we regarded ourselves as part of the group. It wasn't until the group split in two that we realised that we weren't actually part of the group. It meant that some children had been accepted and some hadn't. Not that they weren't going to be, but they just hadn't been accepted yet. The one specialist whose medical opinion determined whether or not most of the children would join either the X list or the Y list was Professor Richard Smithles of Leeds University. The children were referred to him by the solicitors Kimber Bull. Well, he talked to us of this. He talked to us of a list of thalidomide characteristics in a child and that Sonia apparently didn't have enough of these for him to state that she was a, th a thalidomide child. He couldn't actually say categorically that Sonia was thalidomide. But he, he didn't say categorically that she was oh, no. not thalidomide. Oh, no, he didn't say that at all. If Sonia had been three, four months older and she could have been conceived while the drug was actually on the market, officially on the market, he would have come down and put Sonia on the X list as a thalidomide child. A number of children on the Y list were born after the drug was taken off the market. But just how quickly and how efficiently were doctors told about the drug? After reports of grotesque deformities from Australia and Germany, distillers wrote to doctors, drug suppliers and hospitals, and a withdrawal letter from distillers was published in both the British Medical Journal and The Lancet on December 2, 1961. But it wasn't until five months later that the Ministry of Health wrote to doctors warning them of the dangers of Distaval, one of the brand names for the drug. But thalidomide was also contained in Asmaval, Valgrain, Valgis and Tensaval, and the Ministry made no mention of these. Keith Yates was born at the height of the thalidomide births. He has spent most of his life in hospital and in pain. He has no ears, just holes in the side of his head. During the nine months of being pregnant, I was con continuously being sick and migraine, and I was always going to the doctors every month for checkups, which is normal. And but nothing seemed to help, and I was fed up with taking tablets. And by the time I got to seven months, I kind of threw them all on fire. Yeah. How many yeah. tablets were you taking a day in those first weeks of um, pregnancy? More about six or seven. Mm -hmm. And when Keith was born, he was born at my parents' home. Um, he was born with no ears, and uh, but nobody had ever told us anything, and we just kind of carried on and brought him up to the best abilities we could. He was just being regarded as a deaf child. That's right. He was. It, this is no, all. This no. is all what we were told is he was deaf and was treated as a deaf child. Nothing else. In spite of his deformity. That's right. That didn't, um, didn't seem to enter into it. They kind of everybody kind of was lenient. He doesn't way. have because he just he had just had a hole on the side. That's of his right. Yeah. And just a mm. piece of skin. Up well, it was covered ear. over. The, 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 yes. He was actually was covered cared. over, and yeah. one side was down here, and the other side was up there. Yes. So he was obviously deformed. Well, he was yeah, deformed. He was a family of facial paralysis as well. Yes. But despite this, eleven years passed before any member of the medical profession suggested to Mr. and Mrs. Yates that their son's deformities could have been caused by the drug. I was talking about Keith, and this doctor just said to me, didn't I think Keith was a flood of my child? And I said, I've never really gone into thinking about that. I was more interested in Keith's life. I said, we spend that much time going backwards and forth to hospital. We haven't really had the time to think about it. He says, well, if I were you, I should uh, do something about it. I'm fairly quick. Did you ask your local doctor to look at his medical yes, records? Yes, and there's nothing yeah. on the records at all. Inexplicably, Mrs. Yates' medical record begins in the fourth month of pregnancy, but it's in the first three months that thalidomide does its damage. He says there's nothing on my medical records. He says, and uh, have a look at prescriptions. Well, they only keep prescriptions for five years, so that was no use. But time we go into asking about Keith. He said he had nothing he in his said medical record about it. He at said all. he nothing in the medical record, but going back, he said that he had thalidomide tablets in his surgery, but he'd not given. He had not prescribed him to anyone. Then, in fact, I understand that one of the doctors... I asked Mr Brooks about evidence in his family's case. Uh, but I'm not satisfied with the evidence because uh, no proper records were kept at the time. Uh, it's accepted that drugs were prescribed, but there's nothing on the record cards. Because I don't think doctors are bound legally to keep records. I think it's just um, 
that it's recommended that they should for, for obvious reasons and for reasons such as this. Uh, but certainly in this particular case, it's made it very, very difficult. Clearly, if records had been kept and the drug had been prescribed, then one would have known one way or the other whether this drug was prescribed or not. Is further medical evidence difficult to get? It is because it's difficult to get any medical person specialist or otherwise, to commit themselves definitely on this point. I think it must be very difficult for them. Why weren't they? You tell me. When you took Keith to see Professor Smithles, what did he tell you? Well, he said that with Keith was 50%, and he needed the other 50 from another doctor. 50% thalidomide? Yeah, from another doctor, to make sure that he, you know, we got the 100%. So he was... In fact, saying that he was prepared to declare Keith the thalidomide damaged child if he had another doctor to yes, agree yeah, with him. Definitely. That's right. Yes, definitely. Mm. Yes. So then also he wanted a, they had a medical record of Mr. Gill, which had done all the operations at Wooden Shaw. No, I went to see Mr. Gill, didn't I, yeah, over this? Yeah, you, you can tell. And I was that. talking to, to him, I said, Do you think that Keith is a thalidomide child? Mm. And he said uh, that he did not think Keith was a thalidomide child because the simple reason he's had dealings with thalidomide children and a thalidomide child usually has deformities of arms and legs where Keith is not, it's his ears. He didn't conform to the type? No. What one can say, uh, I think, is that thalidomide generally produces anomalies which are fairly typical and fairly characteristic. But uh, for all sorts of reasons which we don't understand, and which may be related to the uh, genetic background of the individual concerned, the response may be atypical. And when the response is atypical, then the malformation could be atypical. In what percentage of, of the cases that you tested did you find deformities in ears and arms? When thalidomide is given between the 20th and the 25th day of development in the primate, we know that the ear and limb is affected very frequently, asymmetrically affected. One side may be worse than the other, but by and large, we get most of them affected if we give the drug at the appropriate period. So the majority of ears would have been affected? The large majority, yes. Mm -hmm. So imagine uh, trying to get a child to get a job, where, in fact, a doctor wants him to go twice a week for a dressing. Who's going to employ him? As a, give him a job as an apprentice? And this is what he wants as a child, to have an apprentice so that he's got a full job when he turns 21. The way things are, there's no future. Do you, looking back now, think you've been rather too trusting? I think so. Problem. Yeah. Problem. We see, we were both 17. I don't think we had enough experience with, with being a family life. We never, don't think, really understood of having a child which was deformed. All we was interested in was the child himself. We was really happy with him. We kind of thought, well, just live a normal life. That's all we ever asked for, was to live a normal life. But our normal life never seemed to exist. It still doesn't seem to come that way now, because he's still waiting to go in hospital again. Yeah. Tell me about that painting of the little boy up there. Oh, I couldn't just resist buying that. <laughs> <laughs> it just reminded me of Keith when I used to see him in hospital. I just, you know, I just loved it. We had a settlement which came from an offer based on moral responsibility distillers accepted their moral responsibility, not legal liability. It wasn't until the autumn of last year when I realised what a serious problem the wireless was becoming because not a single family from the wireless had been transferred to the Exodus. And of course, unless they're transferred, they get no money at all. Seems to me that the, the simple answer for the, the wireless tragedy, dilemma, is for that very medical panel set up by Dr. Vaughan to assess the extent of the injuries of the X-list children, for them to examine each Y-list child and give their opinion on whether the child is thalidomide damaged. That panel has the widest experience and competence, having already examined over 300 X-list children. Where do the, the Y group go from here? The only way they can go is to 
try and convince the stillers solicitors um, that they are not Y group and in fact should be on the X group list. That in fact the, the deformity affecting the child or the child of the family uh, was caused by their drug or it is more than likely was caused by their drug. I think people should appreciate that these parents are not asking for something that they're not entitled to but what they are asking for is that there should be no reasonable doubt one way or the other as to whether these children are thalidomide deformed or not. It just isn't good enough when we're talking about a child that's got no arms, no legs, is not going to be able to live a normal life, is going to require a lot of finance in order to live. You know, is it right that on such woolly information is his whole future should be decided? What can a wireless family do if they fail to get on the X list? They can, uh, within the terms of the agreement, uh, as I understand it so far, apply to the High Court, to the judge, for an opinion, a final decision. When one has evidence to support it, or further evidence, or the best possible evidence one can accumulate, uh, and go before the judge and say, look, this is what we have, this is what we say, these are all the facts as far as we're concerned and concerning our case. We want you to say, whether you consider this child is an X-list or a Y-list child. Well, it's not our life I'm thinking about, it's Sandra's later. I mean, it's Sandra you've got to think about how she's going to manage when she gets older and, you know, if she had a bit of something behind her, you wouldn't worry about when she got older. I mean, no, our worry is what she's going, how she's going to manage and what she's going to do when she gets older. I mean, that, that's really what you're fighting for, isn't it? Sometime or other, she's going to have, to have to look after herself. We're more concerned in Keith's life and we're thinking more of his future. More this is what we're fighting for, you know. It's... We just got to think about Keith when he leaves school and gets into a man. But we're never going to have money, any money, whatever happens. We're never going to have money. Um... Why do you say that? Well, because we aren't. Money's going to be for Sonia, given to Sonia. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. We won't have money. But I meant. You, I meant Sonia. We won't even have any control over the money. We don't want any control over the money. We just want it there for Sonia's security when she's older. See, we don't. Money we couldn't don't help a great it. deal now. Not now. The thing couldn't really help us. Couldn't really help Sonia now. Make life a little bit easier, perhaps. Perhaps take a little bit of worry off our shoulders, but not, not really help her. It's when she's older. It's when she's really going to need some help. And that's what the money's for. When she's older. When she's a teenager. Well, when she's older than that, when she's older than that, when she's middle-aged, when, when, when we're not around to look after her, she's going to need money then. This, this settlement, this lump settlement, is supposed to provide an income for these children until the last one of them dies. Now, that is the exact words. Until the last one of them dies. When the last one of these Thalidomide the children die, that fund should be empty. This is a film about injustice, injustice on a scale that most of us would never imagine possible in this country. It's a film about the imprisonment of people without trial, of innocent people, first offenders, petty offenders and children. And I should emphasize that those you see and hear from in this film are not isolated cases, but represent many thousands who, almost unnoticed in the last few years, have been caught in a system which has become almost as chaotic and repressive as in countries without even the pretense of our Bill of Rights. 
So I tried to ask for my rights. What was I allowed to do and what wasn't I allowed to do? And I mean, they just nobody will give you any answers. What happened then? You, you asked a warder what your rights were, did you? Yeah, I asked you... for a book, you know, because yes. you're supposed to be entitled to a booklet which gives you the, your rights. Yes. But I never received one. They said, oh, tomorrow, the next day. Yeah. Everything is sort of waiting around, putting off, you know, they're as unhelpful yes. as possible. Yes. To me, this 14 weeks was the biggest shock of my life. I mean, I'm not doubting that I've lived rough. Sometimes I've had to. But uh, a rougher living you'll never get. I've never lived in a pigsty, nor at pig's bull. But for 14 weeks, I had to. I mean, I was crying all night. One, because uh, I just couldn't believe it, you know, that... <laughs> I, this place that I'd always sort of heard about, that I was actually in, you know, and all this sort of noise and clanging of bars and yeah, but You suddenly hear in the middle of the night screams and someone's bashing down a door, you know. Or well, someone wants to go to the toilet, you know, and then no one will answer them, you know. The facts are these. Out of 50,000 people whom magistrates remand in custody every year, more than a half, that is 25,000 people, are later proved completely innocent or are merely fined or given a conditional discharge. At Brixton Prison in London, men spend an average of three months locked in cells while they are still presumed innocent. At a prison to which the Home Office gave me access and described as no better or worse than the rest, I saw people on remand who are kept three to a cell, 12 feet by 7 feet, airless and stinking, with only a slop pot each, for 22 hours a day. As in most prisons, they are mixed arbitrarily with criminals. This film does not question the right of magistrates to remand villains in custody. What it does question is the judgment of those magistrates who, on a whim or in keeping with a politically inspired climate of law and order, are jamming our oldest and worst prisons with people who have every right not to be there. I asked London solicitor Ian Sherratt, who has studied the whole question of remand, is bail a right or a privilege? We must remember that uh, in England, still, the person is uh, innocent until he's proved guilty. And therefore, when a man appears before a court, uh, before he's either pleaded guilty or he's found guilty, he's an innocent man. And therefore, he's entitled to his freedom uh, until he's been proven guilty and his, his freedom or liberty has been taken away from him. So therefore, it, it certainly is a right uh, for that reason only that he's an innocent man as he stands in front of the court and there are still certain magistrates who feel that their task or feel perhaps politically emotionally insofar as society is concerned their task is to teach people a lesson they feel that people can be deterred by tough sentences my own experience from the contact i've had with people after they've come out of prison has been completely to the contrary People come out with feelings of resentment and bitterness if they've been treated unfairly. They're bitter against the magistrates, they're bitter against the judges, they're bitter against uh, the establishment in general. And it certainly doesn't cause people to say, well, the establishment has shown its strength, I will now behave myself. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, teach people that at all, in my experience. The resentment which apparently builds up in people who feel they've been unfairly treated really only needs to be seen to be understood this is holloway prison a young woman i shall call helen was sent here to await medical and welfare reports she had been charged with stealing a cheap pair of slippers she had never been in trouble with the police in her life and finally she was given a conditional discharge what was the day like in the, in the cells what time of the day well they turn turn a very bright overhead light on at about 6 30 or 7 o'clock in the morning when you have to get up and dress and then at a certain time they will open the doors and you have to uh, rush down to the toilets and there are four toilets and there are 96 girls in there and uh, the conditions are absolutely disgusting. I, I just can't describe them to you, how revolting they were. Now, most of these were remand prisoners. But, uh, yes, this was the remand sense that everybody in there was on remand. No one was actually convicted of anything. They were, and know, some of them were quite young, were they? Yes, a lot of them were, were 15, 16, 17 year olds, yes. I mean a lot younger than I am. And then you had about five minutes to all rush down and queue up for your breakfast and then go back to your cell where they lock you up to eat it. And a couple of 
tea, which comes in buckets and they carry it along, you know, swinging their arms. It's just absolutely revolting, the food. It's practically inedible. I couldn't eat most of it. And, and what, what happened after breakfast? What, did, what was your day? Um, well, they lock you up again then until um, exercise time. And exercise time consists of walking anti-clockwise round a large, very bleak-looking yard <laughs> for about half an hour, depending on how the prison warders feel at the time. And um, then they take you back to your cell and they lock you up again until lunchtime, which is at 11.30 in the morning. And you eat your lunch in your cell and the afternoon's pretty much the same. And at um, 3.30 you have a piece of um, bread with margarine and jam on it for tea and another cup of tea. And then they lock you up for 12 hours until 7 o'clock the next morning and that's it. While you were in there, did it ever arise when you were talking with the warders, whenever you could talk with them, that you were a person who, were, who was innocent until you were proved guilty? Did that question ever arise? No, I mean, they just had no care whatsoever. They, had no, they didn't seem to give a damn about anybody in there. It was their job and they were going to go by the rules and the regulations and you were there and you had to suffer. You know, they made you really feel like you know, you'd done something terribly wrong and you had to pay for it you know, in every respect. I mean, it was very humiliating and they, were, you know, they made you feel just sort of not even human, really. Sort of, the way they used to speak to you, they used to sort of practically sort of spit the words out at you, you know, and it made you just want to retreat and hide away. That's the sort of feeling I got, anyway. I've watched you getting angry as we've got closer to, to Holloway. Yeah. Do you, is your feeling now, well, it's only a couple of weeks since you were there, are you yeah. bitter about it? Are you bitter about... Having, having done two weeks for something that someone would normally only get a couple of pounds fine, or as indeed as you got a conditional discharge. Are you... I'm very, very bitter, and I have just total contempt for what I consider law in this country and so-called justice. I asked Victor Lissack, a Crown Court judge, just what was wrong with the remand system, how this whole unjust situation had come about. Well, I think it's a worrying situation, and I think it's um, a situation which has really got to be put to an end. Uh, I'm pre perfectly prepared to concede that there are far too many people at the present time who are remanded in custody. I think one of the reasons is particularly the person who's uh, arrested and brought before a court very quickly, that not nearly enough investigation appears, uh, and the bench or, or the magistrates concerned are prepared to remand in custody without really investigating the matter in any great depth. But isn't the magistrate required to investigate uh, police objections to bail? And it, 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 most people are usually remanded in custody on the flimsiest of objections to bail. Yeah. The magistrate concedes and, and off they go to jail. Why doesn't he investigate these as he's required to do by law? Well, of course, a, a good magistrate, and that's the trouble, Mr Pilger, we don't live in a perfect world and one doesn't know what good means anyway, but a good magistrate would not necessarily accept police objections to bail just on the face of it. Um, I think the more inexperienced and the, and the ones who aren't prepared to take the trouble are prepared to think that if the police object to bail, the defendant's better go into custody in the first week and then it can all be sorted out later on. For Edward Chappelle, it was never sorted out later on. Edward spent 14 months in prison on remand. He was repeatedly refused bail, and when his case finally came to court, he was completely acquitted. Part of his imprisonment was spent here at Ashford Remand Centre. For the 14 months that you spent without freedom, and all that entailed, what kind of compensation can you get for that? You can get nothing. I've written to MPs. I've had letters from Minister of State. Um, you don't get a thing. Uh, one point that I'd like to make clear, if I can, is that I think that when I was released, I went down to sign on the dole, and I was told that um, I wasn't entitled to 14-month stamps, unemployment stamps, so therefore couldn't claim unemployment benefit. Um, or you are treated exactly the same as soon as you come out, are treated exactly the same as a man who served perhaps three years' life. Yes. In, what, in what way? Have you had trouble getting work? Oh, God, yeah. You know, I mean, you try explaining why you haven't got 40 month stamps on your cards. No. You know, and it's a very difficult thing to explain. How do you explain it to, to an employer? Towards the end, um, I started telling the truth and told them that I'd been acquitted after a very long trial. Uh, towards the end, I just gave up because I was getting nowhere, and I I sort of said that I spent 40 months on the continent because they just don't want to know. What are your feelings now? Are you very 
very bitter about that. I'm, I'm angry that, that society will let places like this go ahead. All right, you know, 14 months is a long time, and it was a very exceptional case. But you get kids who are doing three months, four months, five months waiting for the Crown Courts. In five months in a place like this, and it, I mean, you can see them deteriorate. When I came out, I lost an awful lot of weight. I looked very ill. Um, and, you know, but I've seen kids who, who've been much worse off than me. And again, I can say I was one of the lucky ones and, and had a lot of fruit and things. But there's an awful lot that could be done for the Iman situation and the, the sort of bail applications. And there's guys in here who are charged with pinching a car and they're here for many, many months and they should be given bail. You know, I mean, I don't know what these magistrates are doing, sitting up on the bench and, and remanding. I don't think they know what it's like to be remanded. How old were you when you were here? I was 18. Was that about the average age of the of Oh, the God, no. There was 14-year-olds. In fact, mm. here they have a special building for 14-year-olds, but there are 14-year-olds on the wing who are locked up exactly the same as we are. Mm. And you read bits in the papers. You hear MPs talk about it, but there's nothing substantially done about it. You know, and it's about time something was done. And you, you see 14-year-old kids this high, sort of wandering around a prison. You know, it's bloody disgusting. How many hours a day did you spend in cells? Well, here it was um, about 22. 22 hours out of 24? 22 out of 24. So you, you had two hours recreation or two well, hours? No, you, uh, you had half an hour for each meal. That was three meals a day yes. and half an hour's exercise. And it's the unconvicted prisoners who suffer. These are prisoners who are waiting to appear in court, who are waiting to, for, for a trial. And, and they're completely innocent and, until proved guilty. But here you're treated as a, as a convicted prisoner. I think it is terrifying to think that persons who are on remand who haven't even been convicted for the most part, and also women who are either remanded in custody after pleading or before they're dealt with, uh, are kept in archaic conditions which are really rather grim and which can only be cured by pulling these places down and having special units built for remand prisoners, which would be healthy and hygienic and one wouldn't have all these rather squalid conditions that uh, arise now. The overcrowding, particularly with the men defendants, is appalling. I don't want to go into too many sort of details. Well, one thinks of the slopping out process at Brixton and the unlocking of people after being kept in custody for hours and hours and hours. It's really rather frightening, you know. But why should any human, or even a really hardened criminal, why should anybody be kept in those conditions? It's not correct. I've been thinking while we've been talking, Mr. Pilger, and I, I think probably I'm as guilty as anybody about this bail situation because uh, I think it's only of recent um, time since I've been a Crown Court recorder and realised the enormity of the power that you have when you're putting someone into custody that um, one realises um, how case-hardened one gets as an ordinary solicitor running around the courts, dealing with people day in, day out, who are remanded in custody willy-nilly, and it, you just get used to it, you know. And if I get case hardened as a lawyer, one wonders what uh, effect it must have uh, on the court that's dealing with this day after day, because to them it's just an ordinary situation, remanding someone in custody without giving them bail. In April last year, two young sisters, Demelza and Genevieve Valbega, were charged with a drugs offence. They were innocent. And eight months later, at the Old Bailey, they were completely acquitted. But they had already spent four terrifying weeks in Holloway Prison on remand. They applied at every opportunity for bail, but it was always refused. Once inside prison, it seemed as if they had already been convicted. I asked the sisters, while in prison, did they protest their innocence? Well, we, we tended to at the beginning, but then we realised there was just no point. You, know, you don't get anywhere in Holloway. Yeah. You do, they won't let you make phone calls. I mean, you, you just... you've. You sink, don't you? Because you know that, they, that the matrons just say, uh, well, you know, we can't do anything. Do it's you? nothing to do with us, it's to do with the court. I'd like to tell you a few instances, actually, about, I mean, Jenny's situation for the start. I mean, she was ill anyway. Well, I was having a lot of treatment with specialists, and I had pills and things, and they wouldn't let me have them in, you know. My sister kept bringing them, you know. 
and they refused because you know they had to go through the laboratories and things you know and all this took time and, and I finally got my pills three weeks later you know. meanwhile I was sort of given aspirins and things you know. so for Terrible. three weeks of that you had no treatment no, for this. No, and no, did no. you have a lot of pain uh, oh yeah I had bad pain it's very bad yeah, yeah. I could hardly m yeah. walk sometimes of course you've got to do everything normal because they treat you yeah. as if you're perfectly healthy you can't yeah. sit there and say yes. well you don't want to do this yeah. you know You've uh, got no choice. And eventually, I mean, I got put on the Valium, and I think you did too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because that was their way of sort of dealing with you. But well, everyone got Valium at one well, yeah, point. Yeah, all, all, all the prisoners were given Valium, you know, well, three just, times a day, you know. Not most of them were, you know. So this was to it's, sedate It's their everybody. choice, actually, yes. but they decide, in the end, you decide to choose it because it, it's, uh, it's you get away from being away, in prison. You know, in other yeah. words, you could walk around feeling oh, quite they all, happily they drugged. All look yeah, fine, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what it is. Yeah, I mean they give you this Valium and you, they've I got mean, everyone the under control. It's yeah, terrible. The, valley, the bell yeah. used to go for medicine, you know, and the swarm all of girls down, would yeah. all run down to this one little place where they were giving out the medicine with eager sort of eyes, waiting for their Valium. You know, yeah, and they give it in liquid form. Liquid form, yeah. and so they make no they, one can it, store it. You know. So Nothing in this way, they control you. They make you open your mouth then and there to see if you've drunk it, yeah. and you haven't saved any. What were your relationships with the warders? Well, some of them were very nice. I mean, some of them who'd been there for a while. For years, yeah. You know, were sort of I think they didn't realise how they should treat mm. people. Anymore. But some of the sort of younger <coughs> ones were very sadistic and very sort of... Uh, Full of new power. You know, the, this power that they had with the keys, you know, was, was terrible. And we had one particular warden who just totally disliked Jenny and I, simply because we were in for drugs. Yeah. I mean, she used to be so sort of, oh, really push us in the cell, yeah. slam the door and lock it, and all you could hear was this key. Yeah, she really know. loved the feeling. So the, really, the <laughs> month you spent in, in Holloway was was done as a punitive measure. This was really to give you a taste of jail. Yeah, because that's what there, it felt there was like. no, a taste, there was, but I mean, was... the taste is really going a bit far for a person yes. who is innocent. Now, why is it that remand prisoners are generally treated worse than ordinary prisoners? They're treated worse often because they can't, of course, be asked to work, and therefore they normally don't get the opportunity of being unlocked from their cells. But it's quite true to say that the remand prisoner, I think, has a very rough time of it. I think it has a, a, a shattering effect on them. After all, um, people shouldn't be um, kept in custody until they're convicted, in my view. And even in serious cases, the modern approach should be, and the more enlightened court, is to grant bail far more freely putting conditions on, of course, um, such as suitable sureties and that sort of thing, but there should be far more cases, I think, where bail should be easier to get. The truth is that bail is often impossible to get, especially if you're poor or black or inarticulate or disturbed. Innocent or not, you'll more than likely end up at a Victorian zoo like Her Majesty's prison at Winsome Green. Roger Smith spent eight weeks at Winsome Green. Roger was a psychiatric case, He'd suffered two nervous breakdowns and tried to suicide three times. Then, while under voluntary treatment at a psychiatric hospital, he was arrested and charged with petty theft. He doesn't remember what or why he stole. His treatment at the time included drugs. And yet a magistrate refused him bail, totally disregarding his illness and refusing even to issue an order that would have kept him in hospital until his case came up. Instead, Roger was imprisoned in a cell with two hardened and violent criminals and without treatment of any kind. Eight weeks later, his case came up and he was given a suspended sentence, which meant, of course, that his crime had never been worthy of prison. And when you first went up before the magistrate, you weren't represented, were you? No, no. But you spoke up for yourself then. Mm-hmm. And, and you told the magistrate exactly um, what your condition was, that you'd had a nervous breakdown and so on, and, and the treatment that was was vital mm -hmm. that you were getting. Um, and what did he say when you told him this? Um, really, John, he didn't want to know. He was just um, adamant. You know, it's see your prison doctor. It's, um, I'd got nine stitches in each wrist. Well, I think I'd got ten in the one and nine in the other through the attempted suicide. And even in prison, when I applied for somebody to come and take them out. You have to go on um, 
put your name in the book to get medical treatment. Whether you're an appendicitis or anything, if you're capable of, you know, going and seeing the PO on the landing, you've got to go. And I requested, and admittedly, a prison officer did come from the sick um, bay to see me. And I asked him if he could take the stitches out, and he asked me how it had happened. He said, was it self-inflicted? And I said, yes. He said, well, you put them in, son, you take them out. Why do you think a magistrate should want to put you in prison, you who were very, very sick and who'd been in under psychiatric care? Why do you think he should do that? Well, the only reason I can give you for that, John, is he's got no incentive towards his job. He's just there, he's sitting on the bench, he doesn't worry about people's problems unless, of course, he's dealing with the case himself. But to remand a man is quite easy. You just say remanded for seven days and that's it. There's no incentive, there's no feeling, there's, there's just nothing. It's a job. But to feel that you, you put a man away for seven days, to them, is just same as me at work. It's just like me spurting a coat of paint. That's all it means to these sort of people. They're supposed to be qualified men. You know, but these magistrates are not accepting the responsibility they're put there for, in my opinion. And they're not qualified to accept the responsibility they're given. You must have thought a lot about freedom. Was there one, one <coughs> memory or one thing that to you expressed freedom? Did you long for one particular thing outside? I don't think you, in prison, you, you can, um, long for freedom. You do long for freedom, obviously, but what you do long for most of all is to get to your trial and to be tried and get it all over with, whichever way it goes, whether you're going to go to prison. But finally, you know what's going to happen to you. It's a suspense of not knowing what's going to happen to you. Did you suffer this anxiety the suspense very much when you're in prison. You've got so many anxieties when you're in prison. You've got anxiety about surviving. Um, yes, I think personally I did. But then again, I've always had the feeling that I was going to get three years, 18 months or... I definitely thought that I was going to be locked away. But. You get so many anxieties, simple anxiety, which, thinking about them outside now, um, they're very material. You know, you wouldn't bother outside. Worrying about where your next cigarette's gonna come from. Worrying about when the next canteen is. Worrying about if you can get out to the toilet. That's a big anxiety, that. And when you do, if they do let you out, which is very, very rarely, Normally you get the old saying, get off that bell. Use your pot. That's, I mean, that's the way you're treated. Fair enough, but nobody's going to live in their own filth. Definitely not. You're bitter about a system that put you away as a very sick person into prison. On that score, John, yes, very bitter. I'm very bitter. This is the reason why I'm doing this interview with you now, because I've seen so much of it in there. People being bullied and treated like dirt. You wouldn't lock your dog in a cell, would you, and not let him go out in the back garden to do his whatever he's got to do? Nobody would do that, but this is what's done to us, or what's done to me. Last year, the Minister of State at the Home Office disclosed that an average of 27 men and women had attempted suicide every year between 1969 and 1971 at Risley Remand Centre. This appalling fact represents the final despair of people on remand who have no one to reassure them of their rights and to whom British justice must seem as remote as their freedom.
There now follows a statement on behalf of the Magistrates Association delivered by its secretary, Mr. A.J. Brayshaw. That was a profoundly disturbing programme. And it raised two main points. The first concerned prison conditions, which are appalling and where I agreed with the programme, and I hope it will help to mobilise public opinion about it. The second concerned the whole question of keeping people in prison until their trial. And there I thought the programme was slanted and tendentious and emotive, and uh, in particular it said things like magistrates keeping people in prison at their whim or wanting to do so, which were quite untrue and unjustified. But there is a real problem, and the problem's this. Of course it's a bad thing to keep people in prison until they're tried. It's also a bad thing to let them go and then they clear off and they frustrate a trial and maybe commit further burglaries and all sorts of things. So the problem is to sort out which are the ones who must be kept in prison until their trial. Now in all those cases we saw in the programme, we weren't told the reasons why they'd been refused bail. There were reasons, but they weren't given. It's almost three years ago that the Magistrates Association asked the Home Office to set up a working party on this subject. And it's just published its report. Here it is. It's full of sensible suggestions. It asks for more information for courts. It asks for a standard procedure. It wants breaking bail to be uh, a specific offence. And this is all to the good. And it also asks for more bail hostels, which are places where people can go and stay until their trial, instead of being kept in prison if they've got no fixed address. And it wants more outpatient clinics where people can get medical reports without having to be sent to prison for that purpose. Well, there are cases where it's necessary to keep people in prison until their trial, but it should only be done when it is necessary to get a fair trial. And if the programme puts that point over, it's a very good thing. state capital in Montgomery, Alabama, the first capital of the old Confederacy, and for the last ten years, the private fortress of George Corley Wallace, son of a dirt farmer, country lawyer, governor, presidential candidate, the spitting, scratching, cocky little demagogue who is today both a cripple and the most important politician in America outside Washington. George Wallace, who once said, segregation now, tomorrow, forever, is no longer the outsider no longer the butt of liberal jokes. Today, he is second only to Edward Kennedy as the popular choice for a democratic president in 1976. And if there are still any doubts about George Wallace's following and his power to make or break a future president of the United States, then they are doubts not shared by those who flock down from Washington to court him. They all come to see George these days. Even Kennedy, Muskie, Humphrey, and all the rest who once scorned him and who now watch in awe as millions of ordinary voting people rally around him. Tell all these folks I'm mighty sorry about them here. Did you lose your house? No, sir. It didn't reach you. Look to my way. George Wallace's formula is simple. Never neglect the power base, the beloved folks. Never stop pressing the flesh, white flesh and black flesh. Even when there's been a tornado, there are votes to get in, white votes and black votes. Ten years ago, most black people in Alabama weren't able to get their names on the voting register, largely thanks to George Wallace. But now they can vote, and so now George needs them. And it's quite likely that most of them will vote for him for governor this year, simply because, like the poor white folks, they know he's the man with the power. Joe, she lost a home. Voted for you for president and vote again, man, if you'll run. Thank you, honey. I'm sorry. I appreciate you saying that. And you lost what, honey? Lost a home completely everything. Don't even have my glasses. Can't even read, so don't say nothing in the paper. I can't read right now. Well, honey, you, you, I'm glad you're alive. 
we're glad we're alive. God help the rest of them will live. Well, I'm sorry you lost your home, but I'm glad you're alive here. Thank you. And you keep your chin up here. Sure will. Okay, honey. Bye-bye. Tell your folks hello here. Sure will. Hello, Hi, fella. Glad to see you here. I'm glad you're all alive here. Brother. Very glad to see you here. Politics is, is really the man, I guess. Uh, now, the question of whether he's changed or not, I was asked this question, or whether he's mellowed or, or whether he's changed his racial policies. Governor Wallace is now telling people in, in national talks that he was never against segregation. He was only for upholding the law. Uh, anyone with any intelligence at all can see that this is not true. I would like to point out to all the people of this state that segregation, in my judgment, is in the best interest of all concerned. And I see nothing sinful, or immoral, or irreligious about a system that's based upon what we believe in our hearts to be in the best interest of all concerned. As governor, I am the highest constitutional officer of the state of Alabama. I embody the sovereignty of this state, and I will be present to bar the entrance of any Negro who attempts to enroll at the University of Alabama. At the height of the Civil Rights Movement, President Kennedy sent federal marshals to confront Governor Wallace's steel-helmeted troopers and to forcibly integrate the University of Alabama. And it was here that Wallace stopped them and made his famous stand in the schoolhouse door. The old political ham has never missed an opportunity. Of course, George pressed only white flesh in those days. Now, therefore, I, George C. Wallace, as governor of the state of Alabama, have by my action raised issues between the central government and the sovereign state of Alabama, which said issues should be adjudicated in the manner prescribed by the Constitution of the United States, and now being mindful of my duties and responsibilities under the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Alabama, and seeking to preserve and maintain the peace and dignity of this state and the individual freedoms of the citizens thereof, do hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. <laughs> I ask you once again to reconsider the consequences of your statement, and I'll ask you once again, will you give me the assurance that you will step aside and peacefully do your duty? Very well. Students will remain on the campus. He certainly made a strong stand for segregation. Uh, he may have believed it. it. It didn't last too long. His segregation forever began to de deteriorate at the University of Alabama, which uh, I believe was a complete farce, too. And Governor Wallace never really blocked the students. He never even saw the students. This was a confrontation more between black and white, more of a confrontation between the national government and the Alabama government. Uh, from a political viewpoint, this is what put Governor Wallace in the national limelight. It got him a lot of speeches. It got him a lot of appearances on the outstanding uh, programs in Washington and really started his career. So whether you can say it was a mistake politically or not, I don't know. The white people in the South who hold public office are now looking to get votes from a, an element of the population that now has the vote that didn't have them. I can point to you uh, within 50 miles of where I'm sitting within the last three days. A, black sheriff said something more or less complimentary to Governor Wallace. In my opinion, that would be a smart thing for him to do, thinking that maybe he could pick up a few white votes by saying that. I think a politician is interested in a vote wherever he can find one. And if a mule voted, they'd ride that mule down Dexter Avenue in order to get the vote, in my opinion. George Wallace uh, uh, believes in segregation. That means he believes in slavery. That's all. Does he still believe in segregation? Oh, certainly he does. I mean, he just believes in slavery. Come to slave holding section, black belt, and he just believes in slavery, that's all. But and a lot of people in Alabama still believe in slavery. He seems to have mellowed a lot, though, has he? Well, yeah, he wants to be elected. He wants on the payroll, sure. Governor, I've covered all your national campaigns since 68, and I've never seen you so mellow. Well, I suppose all of us mellow with age a little bit in the sense that uh, we don't uh, need to shout as loud as we did to get your attention. You know, a few years ago when we were talking about issues involving government, people uh, who espouse the viewpoints I espoused and as far as big government is concerned had to talk pretty loud. In fact, they almost had to streak up and down Connecticut Avenue in Washington to get attention from you folks 
in the news media. But after the primaries and the successful ventures of sending messages by showing people that the attitude of people in Michigan and California was the same as the average citizen in our own state, and the attention I paid to our state, you don't have to talk as loud now to get your attention. People in this state never have uh, supported politicians who oppose people because of the way God made them. They oppose the heavy hand of big government trying to run everything at the local level. That was the issue. But the media interpreted that because the media, especially in other parts of the country, has to have somebody to fight and malign. And so it was our part of the country and it was those of us in public life. But they went too far with it because they found out the average man, the more they maligned us, the more they wanted to hear from us. And when they heard from us, they heard, well, my goodness, that fellow speaks exactly my feeling. How can a man change from his views of those days when he said segregation now, tomorrow, and forever? How can he change my children? I think children you are so obviously on? a very intelligent person. And whether you ask me that question, debate me or not, or whether you ask that question because you're not familiar with the ability to most successful politicians from to blow and suck at the same time and talk out of both sides of the mouth. Maybe that'll answer your question. George Wallace's audacity is unlimited. Here he arrives at an Alabama high school whose integration of white and black children he once fought so bitterly. It's speech day, and George, of all people, is to talk on the subject of towards better government. Today, the people of our part of the country are respected and recognized as the people who are in the mainstream of American political thought. And I have spoken to groups all over the United States. And I used to say when I was a young man back in junior high and otherwise, I hope someday I can tell the people of our country about the great people of this region. Because the news media in those days used to really talk about your grandfathers and grandmothers and your mothers and fathers. If you read what they said about them, you wouldn't recognize them because it was something evil and bad. And they had all sorts of attitudes that were just not in keeping with the mainstream of what those who thought they knew best we should think. I went on a college speaking tour when I was first governor, when you all were too young to remember it. Back when it was very difficult to speak at a college, you'd come out alive, you made a successful trip. <laughs> Back in the 60s, this was one successful trip from which George came out alive. Students and the peace movement tried a new tactic on George, wildly cheering his every inflammatory statement. This was the old George, the real George, the one the liberals loved to hate, rather like Genghis Khan dressed up as Mickey Rooney. That's right, you little punk, you. Why don't you come on up here? One would hardly guess that the man who has whipped up so many mobs is himself terrified of crowds. I'll tell you what, when I'm elected, I'm going to come back to California and you just try me when I get back. You just try me when I get back. I have always said that if it ever came to the point, he would put cork on his face and paint his face black to get the black vote if that's what it took to get it, unless there was a stronger reaction from the whites that would negate it. We were not against people because of the way God made them and never had been. That we were basic religious people. But we were against big government trying to control every phase and aspect of people's lives because my young friend, big government is the enemy of the people. There's an inborn, inbred, inherent, habitual antagonism against federal government in the South. But surely that's where George Wallace derives his power yes, from. Yes, and I would say that the average Southerner wants everything he can get out of the federal government but wants no part of it. So when Wallace talks about being against big government, he's appealing to that old Civil War He's hangover, appealing he? to the individualism, the militancy, and the pride that a Southerner has, just like the British soldier walking down a 
street like he has his foot on the whole world, which I used to watch a New Zealand soldier and, and a British soldier walk with his head up. And I respected him for that. And a southerner will fight you tomorrow morning over a woman's honor, over the Civil War, or over nearly anything. We're fighting people, rough people. Another stop in Georgia's relentless day-after-day -day campaign. If you travel with him, it's not hard to forget that he's in pain most of the time. Always at his side, along with the ever-present cops, is Cornelia, his extraordinary wife who has plotted his comeback, who stands beside him every morning shouting encouragement as he heaves himself along parallel bars, trying to walk. Someone unkindly called Cornelia the Jackie Kennedy of the Rednecks. In fact, she's a very sharp political lady. From the day she married George, she has set them both on the road to the White House. She has played the role of beauty taming the beast. She has stopped George reaching into his britches and scratching in public. And the other day she bought him a Gatsby suit. Anything to change his image from that of a little punk to something rather more presidential, or at least vice presidential. Oh, what was that Julian Bond said? A leopard can't change his spots. His spots. Yeah. <laughs> He's a good politician. He uses whatever tactics are helpful to him at the time. And if, uh, if being liberal is good for his image at the time, he'll do it. You know. Why so, isn't he talking about race anymore? Because it's sort of a, a dead issue right now. It's not the best strategy to use, you know. He's just a politician. I mean, he's a good politician. No, he hasn't changed. He just put on the front, really. Do you think? Do you think he's changed or put on the front? No, he's, he's still the same George Wallace. That's right. He's just trying to prove right. George Wallace. Prejudice and everything else. He's just doing things to influence people to vote for him. He's trying to win election, come election. Has he got a good chance of getting to Washington in 76? No, he's going to be shot again. He really is. Yeah, George Wallace was shot at a rally in a shopping center in Maryland during his presidential campaign in 1972. George was then running as an independent candidate for president and had already won 35% of the national vote in the primaries and had the southern vote at his bidding. Indeed, to those paranoid conspirators in the White House, he was the one spoiler who could reduce Richard Nixon's majority or even bring him down. On the evening after I interviewed Cornelia Wallace, she told me that she knew about a certain photograph which showed Arthur Bremer, George's would-be assassin, and one of the leading Watergate conspirators together shortly before the assassination attempt. She said, we know Bremer wasn't a loner. We know something smells about the whole affair. Who really shot you, Governor? Who really shot me? The other day you talked for the first time, I think, about a possible well, conspiracy. Well, I've been asked questions many times. I've never initiated in a statement about uh, did I hear the rumors about Bremer being friends and knowing so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, I have no knowledge of him knowing anybody. Uh, there are questions in my mind, though, of how an unemployed boy, man, who was a bus boy when he was working, could save up enough money to buy an automobile and guns and travel to Canada and to New York and stay in the Waldorf Astoria and to uh, rent limousines. And he kept a diary. And he never kept a diary before. And it seems that all these political assassination attempts and assassinations are made by people who keep diaries. So I am not satisfied in my mind that he was a loner. Was he a political assassin? I have no idea. Uh, about that, but uh, I don't believe he was a loner. Of course, it was just a matter of like 30 minutes before we got to the hospital and I learned he was paralyzed, so I never mentioned. Then, from then on, I encouraged him to get ready to go to the Democratic Convention. And I encouraged him. We used the politics to kind of like a medicine or a tonic. The best medicine and tonic George could ever have is here among his most beloved folks, the Fraternal Order of American Police, enjoying their annual dinner at the Hotel Parliament House in Birmingham, Alabama. To these upholders of that Neanderthal creed euphemistically known as law and order, George can tell his oldest, most tired stories, and he'll still lay them in the aisles, because George's folks are like that. In 1968, I ran in the presidential campaign and talked about law and order that it was a shame in this great society and supposedly most civilized nation on the face of the earth 
that you could not walk the streets of the larger cities of our country because the thugs had taken them over. I used to say if you walked out of this building tonight and are knocked in the head, the person who knocks you in the head is out of jail before you get to the hospital by some federal judge's edict, and on Monday morning they blame the police about the whole thing and say he started it, and that that's something that's got to stop in this country. Well, one of the candidates in the presidential campaign immediately labeled that as demagoguery. Just like I said in 1968 in the urban welfare states, you ought to get people off the welfare rolls who are not entitled to be on them because it's taking money from the classes of middle class America and pushing them into the ground, economically speaking. Mr. Humphrey, who was a good personal friend of mine, said that's demagoguery. But in 1972, when I went down to Florida, the first statement I heard him make on television on an ad was if you would elect me president, I'm going to get the welfare chisels and loafers off the welfare rolls. And another one of his ads was that if you'll elect me president, I'm going to guarantee safety on the streets and uphold law and order here in these United States. Something that four years prior to that was demagoguery. But I remember that the mayor of New York, he challenged me to a debate in Florida. That was his big issue. I wanted to debate Wallace. Well, I was from Clow, Alabama, and I got to thinking about, you know, this is something. The fellow from New York won't debate a fellow from Clow, you know. <laughs> we had 875 people in Clow, and my wife came, came from Tabernacle in uh, Coffee County, so I wouldn't debate him because I said, let him draw his own crowds. He wasn't drawing any crowds, and I was. <laughs> so every time that I would speak, like in Tampa before a big crowd, they would turn a bunch of chickens loose on the stage with signs hung around their neck, live chickens, saying, Wallace is chicken, he won't debate Lindsay. Well, I told my people, I said, you catch those poor little New York chickens because those little New York chickens look nice and good, and I want you to catch them, but don't you let Mayor Lindsay have them back to carry them to New York because if they ever get back to New York and get on the streets of New York, they'll be mugged or robbed in 10 minutes after they get there. Does he want to be president, want to be vice president, or a kingmaker? Oh, I think with Governor Wallace's uh, ambitions would be to, pre to be president. Whether or not he would accept another compromise of that were not possible, but I don't see how anyone, or, or I personally could not see anything except that he wants exactly what he's running for. He wants to be president. Would you like to be president, Wallace? Well, I wanted to be in 1972 and 68. Uh, whether I want to in 1976 will depend upon whether or not there are those uh, on the political horizon who represent the viewpoint of the people that have not been represented a long time in government. Uh, I don't rule anything out, but I don't rule it in because I have made no definite decision in my own mind. Can you imagine uh, a ticket of Senator Kennedy and Governor Wallace? Well, I've heard a lot of talk about it, you know, <laughs> but I don't know. I think certainly for the Democratic Party, it'd be the strongest ticket they could have. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Kennedy people probably would not like it, and the Wallace people probably would not like it. But if the Democratic Party mm -hmm. could get that ticket together, I think it'd be the strongest voter appeal mm -hmm. ticket because it would get two strong, large factions of the Democratic Party together. Mm -hmm. They say that when, Kennedy, when Senator Kennedy came down to see Governor Wallace last year, that was the beginning of the, the South returning to the Union. Is that hmm. fair? <laughs> Maybe it was the beginning of the Union returning to the <laughs> South. <laughs> On the 4th of July, 1973, Edward Kennedy came down to Alabama to pay homage to the power of the man whom he once described as representing all that was wrong with America. But now Ted needs George Wallace because Ted wants to be president. And George has all those folks and all those votes. How powerful will George Wallace be in 76, in the presidential campaign? Well, of course, this, condi uh, this depends a lot on, uh, on conditions. Uh, it depends on, uh, on who runs. It depends on the reactions uh, to Watergate. He he'll uh, obviously have a lot of votes to deliver to somebody. Uh, yes, for some reason that we don't understand in Alabama, I guess, uh, Governor Wallace, although we have printed so much about uh, corruption in government and although he is the governor and although he hired most of the people that uh, are running the departments the people in Alabama have never co connected him personally uh, to the corruption 
Uh, they consider that he's completely honest and, and completely without blame in this. When he's with his own people, his power base, the old George can be his true scratching self, free from the protection of Cornelia, who has put out a directive that the governor can be interviewed only if his table manners are off the record. Cornelia has also directed that her husband must be guarded at all times, like a president or a Kennedy or the most powerful politician in America that he is. George's place in American politics almost caused his death during the last presidential campaign. And the next presidential campaign has already begun, and with it a struggle for power in which George and his folks almost certainly hold the key. That I appreciate the fact that you have allowed me to come through the rough years to better years, in the sense that the things that we advocated and talked about, they didn't listen. And some of the news media over the country sometimes say today, have you changed? Well, I said, no, I haven't changed all of that much. All of us have changed. We live in a period of change. But you didn't listen in the first place to what we had to say. You had us stereotyped. You had us in this particular region of the country as something less than good, not quite up to par with other people, and therefore you didn't listen. But now you have to listen because I am so proud of the prediction that I made 10 years ago that someday they're going to discover us. Someday they're going to find us out. And when they discover us, they're come, going to come to see us. Well, you know, we've had the president of our country twice in this state in the last three years. And in Huntsville the other day, unlike what his party used to say, what did he say? Alabama is the conscience of America. That's what he said. The important part is not whether he can be elected president. The important part is whether he's convinced that he has a chance to be elected president. You know, politicians get to the point to where they believe things that are kind of far out. And if he's convinced that he can become president, I think that, that he'll go all out for that. If he is convinced with the information and he has a good feedback, uh, if he's convinced that he can't be president, then I think he would accept a compromise of uh, vice president rather than just playing the spoiler part. Could you imagine yourself as a first lady in Washington? Well, yes, well, a little reluctantly, but I, <laughs> I guess I would be very thrilled to see my husband be president if he would want to. Mm. But I have no desire to assume those res awesome responsibilities. Mm. Ten years ago, many Americans saw George Wallace as the caricature of a segregationist southerner. Today, it's fashionable, almost liberal chic, to say George was misunderstood, that he's really a populist a man of the ordinary people, white and black. The truth is that George Wallace has great power in America today, and it's a power that could decide who occupies the White House in 1976, is derived from an old source, opportunism. George Wallace is what Nixon lived his life to be and failed. He is a brilliant opportunist, a superb manipulator of contemporary American passions and of fools, a political con man second to none. Ten years ago, the issue which fed George Wallace's opportunism was race, black versus white. Today, he never mentions race. He doesn't have to. Today, the ground for his opportunism is gentler, more fertile. He can play at being the megaphone for the ordinary persecuted little guy whom the American dream has passed by. And if that doesn't work, which is unlikely, he'll think of something else. Either way, the governor believes he's headed for Washington. Are you closer to Washington now than you think you've ever been in your political career? When you say closer... I mean closer to holding office in Washington. Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, I'm not a candidate for office anymore. I, uh, and I, I'm running for governor. I don't say that I wouldn't be, but really I'm thinking about governor right now. But uh, I'm closer than I thought. I reckon you thought I'd be 10 years ago. You say that.
What was that day like when you arrived in Newcastle? Oh, it was a very cold day, very cold indeed. Um, it this was, was the, winter, was it? No, it wasn't quite winter. It was the, um, the 24th of August, 1961. And I was shivering, the tears were rolling down my cheek, you know. I was saying to myself, why did I leave my beautiful, you know, homeland, you know, to come to face this misery? You know? And um, an English lass came to me. She said, where are you going? Oh, I said, I'm going to Newcastle. She said, well, I don't want to daunt your spirit, but you're going to the worst part of the country for weather, you know. She says, it's way up north and it's very cold and damp up there, you know. <laughs> and um, eventually I found out this was so. It, you know, it's, it's dampness that really gets us up here. It's, it, you know. But I reckon once you can live in Newcastle, you can live anywhere in the world, you know. Gus Gill came from Trinidad 12 years ago to the mother country. At least that's how Gus thinks of Britain. And this film is about Gus and Julie and their family, and especially Errol, their eldest son, who's a Geordie with the one difference that he's black. The Gill family aren't meant to typify the black population of this country. Tyneside doesn't have ghettos like Brixton and Bradford. But what is typical about them is their journey through a racial minefield that is our society, and through all our racist fantasies, like the one that accuses immigrants of living off the dole and taking all the jobs. The Gill family, like the overwhelming majority of immigrant families, has given more to Britain than Britain has given to them. They take less from the social services than the equivalent white family. They're not on any council's housing list and they've never been out of work. I suppose it's a cliche to say that they're a family of our times, but that's what they are. Because even though most of the media regard race as something best left ignored, race is still the issue. At least this one British family knows that. This is Errol, age 19. His mother, Julie, a very gentle woman. His nine-year-old sister, Andrea. And 14-year-old, Wendy. Like most Geordies, Errol is confident and sharp. Judy is seven and the youngest. Leon is 16 and on his way to an apprenticeship with Middlesbrough Football Club. Gateshead is Errol's turf. He was seven when Julie brought the family from Trinidad to this industrial valley, the year after Gus came over alone. And since then, his school, his job and his home have all been here. What do you miss about Trinidad? What do you miss? I miss the food, the weather in particular, yeah. the climatical conditions, is, you know, it's just ideal. And friends, you know, I've got, you know, I had lots of friends in Trinidad. I've got lots of friends in England now, you know, but um, you, you do feel homesick now and again. There's no place like home, really. Gus, did you get a shock when you encountered the first expression of prejudice? Yeah, I was indeed surprised. I'm not, not sure, uh, I wouldn't call it surprised, you know, because, I mean, that sort of thing never happens in the West Indies, you know. Uh, the thing is this, um, if you've got the money, you can go anywhere. You can go to the country club. I mean, I have been to the country club many times, you know, or with singing, you know. With, you know. But once you've got the money, you can go, nobody will stop you. You can, you can build a house anywhere. You can buy a house anywhere. You don't find these prejudices. But if you don't have money, I mean, people sort of look down on you. you know, that's the sort of thing. Had, had you expected to find any? No, no, not at, all, because, not at all. Because not at all. Because I knew quite a lot of English people in Trinidad, and I got along marvelously well with them. You know. And what was it? What was that? The first time that you ran into racial prejudice? Well. Um, the, the, the first difficulty was, you know, when I heard uh, the remark, you know, by this cripple, you know, when he, when he told the lad that went to his assistant, you know, take your hands off me, you're a black bastard. You know, I was shocked, you know, I, I never thought that, um, 
I would hear such a remark from, you know, people from a civilized country. This is the West End of Newcastle, Tyneside's small black ghetto and Gus's introduction to a civilized country. Rocky Byron is Gus's oldest friend. Rocky was working in a foundry when Chris Mullard, the author of the book Black Britain, took him into community relations work in Newcastle. Since then, Rocky started an experimental club for black and white kids. And this is the house in Warrington Road where Gus came when he arrived on that rainy day in 1962. He was then at the bottom of the hill and the bottom of the heap. And the bottom of the heap for Gus meant a casual job with British Railways, a week's work for just £7.10. You know, there's one fact that um, the black man has to face. There is no middle road. If you're a black man, you're a black man. I am not saying that as black people, or even Merrill, that we shouldn't conform to certain things within the structure of the society. But he must realize, he must preach, he must say I'm black. Once he's going to walk outside with a false identity, once he's going to feel that because all my friends are white, and because they are patting me on the shoulder, that I can walk into an office or go and ask for a job with the assumption that I'll be taken for white. Well, that's it, he's finished. This is Moore Street, where Gus took his family from the ghetto, partly thanks to a loan from his old friend Rocky. This was the white society whose acceptance was so important to Gus, and he moved his family into number 63, the only black family in the street. Gus was now halfway up the hill. Did you know Mr. Gill, his dad, yes. very well? Yeah. Mm. Keeping all right? Yeah. Your mum and all. I see yeah. your mum pretty often, you know. When, when they first moved in, was it, uh, was it a surprise to all the neighbours having coloured family in the street, or, or did it well, matter? Well, I mean to say, some people, you know, yeah. they're not like what I am. I mean to say, I'm not prejudiced at all. Yeah. Never have been. Mm. It's, uh, I was out in India for a, a long time. Yeah. And I... Uh, and got used to these people. Yeah. Did in those first days when when uh, the Gill family arrived, did, was uh, was there a time that they had to get over to uh, to be accepted, or were they? Is it? Well, I don't know. I think they were pretty well accepted here, mm. more or less, you know, because uh, well, we took them straight away. You know, yeah. You know, we, we, uh, with your mum and dad. I'll tell them that you, yeah. I've seen you and you've yeah. said hello. Yes. Well, I remember you. Yeah. Eh? You all know me father very well. Mm. I knew he was singing, all right. Fun. Did they hear him singing? Yeah, they, they've got a Methodist church down the oh, bottom. He used to and sing and, uh, once or twice, and then you know he went to different dudes all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. The life crown is won when our troubles and the trials are o'er. I remember, you know, the, um, the, the first year that I won the, the, the writing competition. I mean, to me, I think this is the steepest competition in the region to win. When I won it that year, I was the happiest man in England. I felt that I had achieved something. I felt, you know, by, um, by win even winning this, um, I was accepted. I mean, there was no discrimination. I mean, the adjudicator could have easily said, well, look, why should I, you know, I mean, give this to a black man, you know, when there's, you know, there were about 11 other white people in the class, you know. But this wasn't so. And I felt then I was accepted as a human being. Do your children particularly, your older children and Errol, do you think they understand the struggle of immigrant parents? No, 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 they don't at all. No, they are just like the, the English children. No, they, they, they feel they very much the English, same, you know. Act the same and, you know, everything. Mm. Like the English children. Of course, I don't blame them. They're, they're not yeah. wrong in this attitude. 
But of course, they, they, they don't know the problems of immigrants at all. Mm. Well, they don't regard themselves as immigrants. No, they no, they don't, you see. No. And there's no reason, really, why they should. Why they should, they? really. It's there any time during the week that you talk with your father? I mean, do you... Do you have any, do you have any, uh, is there any time that you have any kind of relationship with your father? Not really, because he's on leave, you see, and, well, by the time I come in from work, he's now ready for going into work, you see. But apart from that, do you, do you have a relationship with your father? Well, not really, you know. Could you imagine the struggle that he's had since he arrived here? Do you? Do you know much about that? Can you imagine the struggle that he's had? Well, I've never really thought of it, you know. Mm. I've just... leading my life and I'm going along, you know. Mm. Yeah. I'm finding out all the problems myself. Yeah. Yeah. Gus is a foreman at this bakery and very proud of the job, almost grateful in a way that Errol and his generation would not be grateful. In return, the company pays him just over 40 pounds a week for working from seven at night to seven in the morning, six days a week. Oh yes, and they put him on the staff. The white world has given Gus what he regards as a final and precious acceptance. Gus's first application for a job was at Dunlop's and the anti-discrimination laws had not been extended to jobs then. So he got on to Dunlop Rubber Company. I was standing in the office there with him and um, the chap said, I heard the boy says, oh yes, we need three men. So the chap said, um, well, I've got a chap here, he, he would like to work constant night shift. So I heard the boy said, you know, on the telephone, um, would you send him down straight away? So he said, um, oh yes, I can do this. He said, but by the way, he's West Indian. And um, the boy said, oh, we don't want any colored people here. Don't bother to send him. Well, of course, I can imagine, you know, I could have seen that the bloke was, the chap, you know, he was embarrassed about this. And um, he said, well, would you not reconsider what you have just said? And the voice on the phone said, I have nothing to reconsider. And he slammed the receiver down. And the chap at the door said, Mr. Gill, he says, I must apologize about this, you know. And he says, well, look, I'll tell you what. He says, I'll make it my business to try to get your job. He says, anything that comes in, you know, we'll send for you at home. He says, don't bother to come. We'll make it our duty to send. And one day, of course, I was in the house, and um, this card came to the letterbox telling me to call to the door straight away. And I went down, and they said that um, Denton's Bakery wanted um, a night shift packer. So the next morning, I came down at 9 o'clock, and I saw the, the shop's manager. And he interviewed me. He says, well, um, I'm expecting some other people so you'll be hearing from us. So I was a bit suspicious, you know, so what I did, I went back to the door and told the chap, I said, well, this is what they told me, but I don't think I'll hear from them. So he took the card, he says, Mr. Gill, look at this. I'm tearing this card up. Nobody else is going to go down to Denton, you know. <laughs> and um, we'll make sure that they send for you. Yeah. But anyhow, by 2 o'clock, I got um, a call from Denton's asking me if I can start the night. And uh, I started, um, th that was the 4th of April six years ago, you know, mm. and, um, and, and well, uh, I started uh, as a packer, and within six months I was made charge hand, and about a month after I was made foreman. Mm. So I've been foreman now over five years. Whereas Gus has struggled and is grateful, Errol is the opposite. Errol is a bonus clerk and a firm making beer kegs. Unlike Gus, he feels no need to crave acceptance because he's grown up here and he regards himself as no different from any other young Geordie. Errol is a black who's grown up white and there are now the first signs that he's having to choose. Until recently, he drew his heroes straight from the white telly world. James Bond and white sharpies like that. But now that's changed. Now in his fantasies, he is Shaft, the all-black hero. Well, well, also. There seems to be a lack of communication between the immigrant father and the Geordie son. Yes, Why because, is that? because it was um, fortunate or unfortunate in the sense that Gus, after he left the West End, where most of his colored friends live, um, and he went over to Gates Head, um, Errol then had to sort of grow up completely in a white society, 
all his friends are white, even from his time of going to school. Mm. So it means that we, the bigger ones who already grown up, mm. yeah, he, he only knows us invariably as his father friend. But he, he was never able to sort of um, meet with us and talk and chat and what have you. So his ideologies would be Europeanized because all the friends he have is white. Isn't that a danger then that he's really growing up with a mental white skin, which means he's, the problems that he might run into later on are going to hit him all the more harder? Well, this could be so. This could be so. And here's where the, 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 the father has to play an important part, yeah. because here's where the father has to bring him back into reality. The father <clears throat> is not going to tell him he mustn't have friends, but the father must prepare him for these sort of setbacks when they arrive, and they are going to arrive. Yes. Do you think Errol is being prepared for that? No, I don't think he has. I don't think he has. So he's, he's in for some shocks later on. Do you well, think? he is, and I'm positively yeah. sure. Mrs. Gill, do you worry at all about the future of your children? Yes, uh, I do. In what way do you worry? Well, I'm in school, and the job is the way to do when they leave school, you know. Um, particularly Wendy, you know. All this feel she's got a more hard time than... Can Errol get along easier? Yes, better I think than... Errol can get on better as he's been a boy, you know. Mm. And he goes along a lot, mm. you see. But Wendy hasn't got anybody to, to take yes. her out or to go out with, you see. And I'm that busy and her dad yes. always, you know. How old is Wendy? Wendy's 40. 40. Mm -hmm. Does she have a boyfriend? No. no. When Enoch Powell started to make his speeches, his inflammatory speeches, how did you feel then? How did you feel particularly after that 1968 speech of his? Well, um, I, I tried to hit the man to tell you the truth, but then again, my better judgment told me that I shouldn't. But um, I could remember after he made the speech, I was going to work one night. And just as I got by that telephone case, there was about seven chaps coming up Whitehall Road. And you should have heard the, the remarks, you know, you black son, so why do you not go back, you know, to your country? We don't want the likes of you here. And some of them started to sing, you know, bye-bye blackbird and things like that, you know. And that old black magic got me on the spell and things like that, you know. Uh, you know, it was sickening, really. But I mean, you know, it's seven blokes, I just walked by and never answered. Did you think at that time that you might like to go back? Oh, yes, yes, I, I did, you know, I did. Because lots of people are quite prepared to accept you. As long as you're, you know, you're not living next to them, you know, or as long as you're not sort of associating with any of their relations. It's all well and good to associate with somebody as a relation and, you know, they're not prejudiced, but once, you know, <laughs> you have walk on their threshold sort of style, then, of course, you see the, the sort of thing come out. How would you feel if er Errol married a white girl? Well, I, I'll not feel indifferent at all. I think uh, he hasn't got any choice. I mean, the point mm. is just there are so few. <laughs> I mean, you know, mm. so I'll wish him all the best. And you, Mrs. Gill? Well, it's yes. the same, it doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter to me. You have all my blessings. On that day, Gus didn't know just how prophetic his blessings were. He knew Errol was involved with a white girl, but he didn't know just how involved. Susan has been Errol's girlfriend for two years. She lives on the top of the hill in a middle-class world where there are no blacks. And Errol's entry into this world on the arm of a white girl has been traumatic. Traumatic not for him, but for the whites on top of the hill. All over Britain, there are small intermarried multiracial groups like those of this party. They're often beleaguered, for as Rocky's wife Doreen says, if you're married black, then your friends are those who've done the same. But what is important about them is that they've come through the most tumultuous racial period this country has known. The years of Powell and immigration panic, and most of the marriages have made it. When we were all sitting at midnight last night in your house, and, and you told us that, um, that you were pregnant and that you were going to get married, what were your feelings then? Were you, were you frightened or were you, were you hopeful or what? 
Uh, yeah. I think we've, I think I felt more relieved. More than oh, I did. Mm, yeah. I was glad. Yeah. You know. why, why did you keep it to yourselves so long? You kept that to yourselves for almost a month, didn't you? Yeah. I would have kept it for longer if you know what I said. That must have been agony. Were you worried about telling your parents? I was. Oh, not my parents. Yeah. I wasn't worried. Mm. But I was because I'm very close to my mum, you know. Yeah. And um, I respect her very yeah. much. What she's done for us, you know. What, what did your mother say when you told her? You told her this morning. Yeah. What did she say? Oh, well, you no, know, she wasn't. She wasn't shocked. Well, mm. she was stunned, but uh, not as much as what Susan's mm. mother. Mm. Uh, and she t she took it all right. Yeah. Are you looking forward to the fact that you'll live in mean, marriage and the baby will make your life fairly ordered? You will have a pattern, a routine of living. Are you? Do you th you're both looking forward to that, to settling down, to that situation, bringing up a family. Is that is that a a good prospect to you, Earl? It'll have to be now, really, mm. because I didn't think that would be. Because I, I didn't think Earl was cut out for anything like that, you know. Marriage you didn't think he was cut out, out for it, yeah. Because I think he's too young, and I'm too young, definitely. But you're 17. Yeah. And you're 19. Mm. Has the climate changed to a point where you could say it's going to be easier for Errol and Susan than it was for you and Doreen as a mixed marriage? No, I wouldn't say so. How I see it is a lot depends on to, uh, the, your area where you're living in. Because let's face it, there are areas here where the, the, the people are more sort of liberal-minded and there are areas where people turn their noses up. I mean, because even in, in this present day and age, at times, if you're walking down the street with a, with a, 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 a white girl, um, people look looks back. So a lot has to do with your area. Um, so I wouldn't say that time really has so much to do with it. Um, a lot depends on your area because don't care how long um, things go on here in Britain, there always are going to be the, the type of people who are not going to appreciate mixed marriages. So I think a lot has to do with your area. And I couldn't see Gateshead as being an easy area for him. Do you think white girls of your age these days don't think twice of, of going out with young black men, marrying young black men? It doesn't matter anymore to your generation. I is do. That, is that... I think they do. Some of them do. Some of the ones that care, the, you know, the respectable ones. Mm. But the other ones, there's a respectable kind of... Um, not respectable kind, you know? Yeah. Some girls aren't, some girls aren't. The yeah. respectable ones always think twice. They Hardy. think twice? Hardy. In what way did you think twice? I thought, well, what would my mum say about this, you know? <laughs> and going out with a colour boy. When I told her, I said, oh, mum, I've got a date. Mm. She said, have you? She was really pleased, you yeah. know, because... Yeah. It was one of the first ones ever had. Mm -hmm. And I said, but it's with a colour boy. Mm -hmm. She was in her face, it was really went straight, it dropped, you know. Mm. But do you think, uh, there's two people who are going to contribute to it, do you think there is ever a chance that we might have a peaceful, truly multiracial society? Have you ever thought about that? Between everybody, you mean. Mm. Maybe it's the younger generation, but not the older generation. But you think amongst the younger generation there is a chance? Oh, yeah, the younger generation. Mm. Not the older generation, because I think they're more... Oh, what's the word? I think they're more... They want to be more dominating, you know, and they want to, the younger generation to do what they do. Mm. You know, we have hard times what they did. Yeah. But it's not that way now. In a few weeks' time, Errol and Susan will be married. 
19 and 17, black and white. What are their chances? Errol will almost certainly make it because he's lucky. He doesn't live in a ghetto like Brixton, and he's not one of those young black Britons whose antagonism to our society, their society, is so great that they start school speaking Cockney and leave speaking West Indian. Yes, Errol is lucky and Susan has no illusions, and their unborn child must take his chances. But he'd better get lucky too. For in the last 10 years, the number of black people in mental hospitals has increased fourfold, from 6,000 to 24,000. And most of them are young, and many of them are suffering from schizophrenia, personality split between black and white. Yes, their child had better get lucky. But of course, if he does get lucky, he'll be starting something. Fantastic season, season. Huh? Come on. Huh?